This happened in the summer of 1993. My dad and his girlfriend, now my stepmother, were living in Cardiff in Wales in the city center. Not a particularly high crime area, but a lot of student accommodation. At 6 a.m., my father gets up and walks to the kitchen to get his morning coffee. As he walks into the kitchen, he is welcomed by a random man sat at the kitchen table, staring at him. Being the cool, collected guy he is, instead of freaking out, my dad asks the guy if he wants a cup of coffee. The breakfast intruder agrees and joins him. A few minutes later, my dad's girlfriend comes in. She also doesn't freak out and offers to make him some breakfast. So the three of them sit down, eat breakfast, and have a chat for 20 minutes or so. Apparently the conversation was a bit weird and nonsensical, but they didn't say what it was about. After they finished breakfast, they escort the breakfast intruder through the front door. After he leaves, they start freaking out and naturally call the police. The police come, take statements, and do their thing. Later in the day, they're contacted by the police, saying they've apprehended the breakfast intruder. It turns out the guy was a paranoid schizophrenic. He was breaking into odd-numbered houses on the street. My dad was the second house he'd entered. The first one he went into was empty. This was where he left his tools, a sawn-off shotgun, and a lot of ammo. His plan was to shoot anyone in the odd-numbered houses on the street. When the police arrested him, he told them that my dad and his girlfriend were the nicest couple he'd ever met, and that had stopped him carrying out his plan. When people say I'm too laid back for my own good, I tell them this story, and it never fails to shut them up. I was around 16 years old when this happened to me. It was just me and my dad at our house, and since he was a businessman that traveled frequently, I was left home quite often. I'm going to do my best to describe the layout of the house so you can better understand the situation. My house is pretty small since it is just my father, my dog, and me living in it. There's a long hallway full of full-sized windows separating my dad's room and mine. Our dog always loved to look out the windows, so we always kept them open for her to look out of. I'm the last room at the end of the hallway. In between the two rooms is my bathroom and a spare room. So now, on with the story. It was around 11pm when the worst night of my life began. My dad was passed out in bed after a long day. I was mindlessly dancing around my house, getting ready for bed. I hopped in my shower, not knowing what was coming ahead. And of course, like a cringeworthy horror movie, my dog starts aggressively barking up a storm. With my excessive knowledge of how it turns out for the girl in the movies, I go out and explore. I head to my room to throw some clothes on while my dog is still shitting a brick. Months before, I'm not sure how I managed to break my door handle, but you don't have to twist the knob to open it. All it needs is a small push. Scared shitless, I barely managed to put a shirt on when my dog opened the door. I look to see her enter my room while in the midst of barking, and that's when I saw it. There is only one window that has vision to the opening of my room, and in the corner of it, I saw a face. A face so seemingly sinister that I can still see it years after. It was dark out, so I took a second to comprehend what I just saw, but when I finally realized it, I screamed. My dad owns lots of guns, so when he heard me scream bloody murder, he ran out with a pistol. He asked me what happened, and I could barely mutter what I saw. He ran outside to see if the man with the terrifying face was still near. We stood out there for a minute, scanning the area. A man was casually strolling towards us from the opposite direction, from about a hundred yards away. I knew it was him. I got that feeling in my stomach that you cannot mistake. It was like he was trying to cover up that he was there by coming from a different direction. That bastard didn't fool me. You better stay the fuck away from my daughter. You see what I have here? You know what this does. My dad was holding up his gun. I could have sworn he was gonna shoot. 
The man brushed these threats off easily. Fuck off, old man, he said. My dad and I went back inside. He went back to bed like nothing had happened, but I couldn't sleep a wink. I kept thinking he was going to come back and hurt me because of the threats to him. We called the cops the next morning and they came out and scoped out our house. They looked around the house trying to calm me down, but I was still pretty shaken up. An officer went to the front yard and that's when he saw it. In front of the windows in the long hallway, there were small bushes, nothing much. The officer went to the window that had the view of my room and there it was. If he tried to tell me the news without making me more upset, he failed. There were indents in the dirt right in front of the window. The officer said he knew where he needed to look for you, and it seems as if he has come here more than once, due to all the broken pieces of bush and the divots in the ground. It turns out he was the nephew of my old neighbor. He had been staying there for a few months. He never got arrested, never got in trouble, Probably barely got a slap on the wrists, but at least he was gone now. How long had he been watching me, I'll never know. All I know now is I keep my door shut, and I never keep the blinds open. So it was a Friday night. Earlier that day, my parents had left to go to an important business meeting early Saturday morning. The city where the meeting was happening was a long way away, so they left early to get to the city around 6pm and stay at a hotel. So I was left at home to watch my two little brothers and my little sister. I was 15 at the time and this was in 2017. So this night I was watching Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone because my siblings really like Harry Potter films when all of a sudden we heard banging on our back door. I got up to see. I saw one man at the back door and two men at the kitchen window. They were all wearing black hoodies. I turned all the lights off and told my siblings to get upstairs. I turned off the living room light and we headed upstairs. As we were doing that, another man approached the front door and started banging on it. We went upstairs and hid in my wardrobe. The men came in and we heard them come upstairs. I heard one of them say, We just want to kill you, so there ain't no point in hiding. My siblings were starting to sob. We heard the men go into our parents' bedroom, and then I decided to escape. I had lived in that house for my whole life up until that point, so I knew where the creaking parts of the floor were. I told my siblings where they were and to avoid them. We made it downstairs and I unlocked the door. However, I accidentally swung it open and it hit the wall. I turned around and saw one of the men at the top of the stairs looking at us. He pointed at us and started screaming. It wasn't like a scared scream, but an alert scream. I ran out with my siblings, and as we got out, I heard the man's scream turn into a high-pitched psychotic laughter. We started running to our neighbor's house, which was a good distance away. We saw the four men chasing us. Luckily, the neighbors let us in and called the police. We waited for the police to arrive, and then we went back to our house. The four men were nowhere to be found. There was nothing else to report apart from two broken doors and windows. This story starts off with me getting home from high school on the bus. I made it home and saw that my mom wasn't there. And since my dad was at work and my brother didn't get out of school until later, I was the only person there. I put my backpack down and go to untie my shoes. And some guy walks out from the hallway. I go into Occam's razor mode and assume that this is some sort of handyman and repair guy, being as we'd moved in recently. I had been getting a lot of repair work done to fix the half-assed DIY electrical, plumbing, and paint jobs left behind by the previous owner. Additionally, he was wearing some sort of tool belt, and it fits the general repairman look. My mom's usually around when we have people working on the house, so I assume that my mom must not have left long ago, and that she would be back soon. I nonchalantly tell the guy that my mom should be back soon, 
and he mumbles something like, thanks, and he leaves out the front door to what I assume is a repair truck. It's at this point that I text my mom asking when she'll be back, and who the guy was in the house. She asks if I'm joking, and it's only at this point that I come to realize that I was sitting on the couch talking with the guy burgling our house. At this point, the guy was long gone. Luckily, my mom was only a couple of minutes away at a store down the road. She gets back and we call the police. They take a look around, but nothing actually went missing. Nothing ever really came of it. I'm honestly glad it went down the way it did. I only knew what happened once it was already over. This guy had put himself between me and the front door. I'm not really sure what freaked out fight or flight me would have done. I also can't imagine what the guy was thinking when I basically just let him walk out. While I was in college, my father came down to help me move into a new apartment complex. The new place was about five stories high, and each level had an identical layout with apartment units along indoor hallways, which were accessible from an elevator to the parking garage below. I was the last one of my three roommates to move into the new place, so there was already some furniture and decor, with which I was not familiar. My father and I were unloading the truck from the garage below, so we would take the elevator to my place on the fifth floor with each load. As we carried my big mattress into the apartment, I had to set it down for a moment to readjust my grip before we went through the door to my new bedroom. That's when I actually looked at my surroundings and thought, huh, I don't recognize that couch. And where did the half-empty bottles of Jack Daniels on the counter come from? Right then, I also remembered that nobody else was home, but I could hear the shower turning off and a man's voice timidly saying, Hello? From the bathroom. As it dawned on me that both of us were in the wrong unit, my dad just shouts, Abort! Abort! He grabs his end of the mattress and shoves me in the bed back out into the common hallway. We realized we'd gotten off on the wrong floor. The unit that we had entered was the floor below mine. Luckily, we made it back to my floor before the poor guy from the shower ever saw us. Fast forward a couple of months, and I had kind of forgotten about this whole event. One of my roommates had gotten to know the guy in the unit below us. They would sometimes come up to our place to smoke or weed. One night, we were all hanging out in the living room with Andrew, one of the downstairs guys. It came up in conversation that we liked the great security in our building, because this was a bigger city than any of us were used to. Andrew agreed in general. But he then told us about this one time he totally freaked out because he was in the shower and he swears he heard multiple people in his apartment thumping around. They were talking to each other right outside the bathroom door. He had always wondered if he'd hallucinated the whole thing because when he emerged from the bathroom, nothing was stolen and nobody was there. At that point, I was trying to blend into the terrible 1980s wallpaper as my face turned red. My roommates all knew and loved the story of my dad and I breaking into the downstairs neighbor's apartment and then running away like total creeps. Of course, one of my girls doesn't miss a beat and said, Oh yeah, that was Gina and her dad trying to move her mattress into your bedroom. After I explained the whole situation, Andrew said he was ultimately relieved to learn it wasn't someone with malicious intent, but I never was able to shake my new nickname, Creeper G. So there's my story, how my dad and I were inadvertently the local sketchballs. I live in a house that's been altered because it's student accommodation, so from the outside, you would think that my bedroom is a living room, because who sleeps on the bottom floor in a house, right? So, it was about 3 a.m., mid-August and very hot. I was in bed scrolling through my phone, and my ex was asleep next to me. I was sleeping with the window open because of how warm it was, and the blinds usually make a quiet rattling noise from the soft breeze blowing through them. On this particular night, I heard the noise, and it sounded slightly different from usual. So I look up. 
My bed is right by the window, and my head is almost right below it. I see someone's hand poking through the blinds, parting them to look through. I immediately sat up and jolted to the other side of the bed. I shouted to my ex, Wake up, wake up, someone's trying to climb through the window. He jumped up and shouted, Oi, and whoever it was immediately bolted off down the road. I honestly felt like I was in a horror movie. I've never slept with the window open again, of course. This happened in the early 90s when I was a junior in high school and was home on Christmas break. It was in the middle of a weekday and I was home alone when the phone rang. When I answered, a man asked for me by my first and last name. He then said, This is Randy. Whatever else he was saying was unintelligible, but the last part he said was, Company. And I was calling to. I tried to interrupt to have him repeat his name and company again. He said it very quickly and unclearly, but he ignored my question and asked if I had been looking for a job. I wasn't, but I was young and sort of wanted to see what the job was going to be, so I hedged a bit. Randy then told me that he was hiring models for commercials, and that someone had given him my name. I laughed because, number one, that sounded completely fake, and number two, I wasn't exactly swimming in model contracts. When I told him that I believed he must be mistaken, he replied, No, I think you're very pretty, Tessa. While that comment may not seem that disturbing, it stopped me in my tracks. He had initially said that I had been recommended to him, but now he was speaking as if he had seen me. And at that moment, I just knew in my gut that something was very wrong. Unfortunately, I had not yet learned to get my brain and my gut on the same page, so while I wasn't buying any of what he was selling, in order to be polite, and maybe... Just in case there was some cash and an eco boost to be had, I said, Okay, how about you just give me your number and I'll talk to my parents and get back to you. I knew if he was legit, he'd have no problem giving me his number. Also, my brother had been asked to do a commercial or a print ad or something a few years before. I knew that my parents had to sign some forms because he was underage. But of course, Randy failed both of my tests. He resisted giving me his number or allowing me time to talk to my parents. He encouraged me just to agree right then. So I promptly said, No thank you, and I hung up. Within seconds of hanging up, the phone rang again. When I answered, I'll never forget what he asked me. He started asking me about different sexual acts. That escalated quickly, as I stood stunned in silence. He repeated a question and then moved on to similar ones. What made it unnerving, besides the obvious, was that it didn't sound like a prank call at all. Even though his comments were sexual, he sounded almost angry. I was safe in my home and it was just a phone call, but it made me feel like I was in danger. I hung up of course, but he called continuously, so continuously in fact that every time I tried to pick up the phone to call my mom, he would either be on the line when I picked up the phone, or the phone would begin ringing again. By this point, I wasn't answering the phone, and if he was on the line when I picked up, I would hang up quickly, but he was getting angrier and angrier. His comments were taking a darker turn. What started is asking me invasive sexual questions had turned into comments about how he'd like to harm me. I was finally able to get through to my mom, and she called the police. They didn't seem to take it really seriously, or even act like they could do much. I didn't recognize his voice, and it wasn't a teenager. It was obviously a grown man. They felt that it was just someone messing with me, and it would just fade out on its own. And for a time, I guess, it seemed like they were right. That first day, he called constantly for a few more hours, but then the call stopped, and although it was very disturbing, 
it seemed to be over. Some time passed and I quit thinking about it, but then spring break rolled around. It was the same scenario as before. I was home from school on a weekday and I was alone. The phone rang and when I answered, he launched straight into the vile sexual talk. I hung up and we began the same cycle as before, with him calling constantly and me trying to time it just right so I could pick up the phone between calls and call my mom. Every time I hung up on him, he got angrier and the things he said became more foul. This time, he started reciting my address and talking about paying me a visit. Not only did it feel very threatening, but it was so confusing. Who in the world was doing this? Why would a grown man I didn't know make these calls? Not just once, but two times months apart. How did he have so much information about me? None of it made any sense. When I was finally able to call my mom, she called the police again. The officer took it a bit more seriously. They asked if we wanted to put a tap on the phone. We agreed. They told us that the process is as follows. It would take 24 hours to get with the phone company and get it active. Once active, it would be there for 60 days. If there were no issues in 60 days, it would be removed. But if there were an issue, then we'd have it. Just like before, the calls continued throughout the afternoon, but they had stopped by the time my parents got home. I got some the next morning after my parents had left for work, but by the time the 24 window had passed, they had stopped. And once again, things were quieter for another few months. This cycle continued over the course of the next year. It was quiet until midsummer, then again until Christmas break of my senior year, and when he called, the pattern was almost always the same. The calls usually started out with him being more polite, but as soon as I recognized his voice and hung up, they became progressively more angry and violent. They always came when I was alone and began continuing the exact moment that my mom or dad pulled into the driveway. We would put the tap back on the phone each time, but the calls never continued for more than 24 hours in a stretch, and there was always at least 60 days in between episodes. The content of the calls, however, got increasingly more personal. He would regularly mention my address, and eventually began talking about my clothing. But then, he started mentioning things that I owned but didn't actually wear, this obviously took our level of fear up a notch. By this point, because he would call right up until someone else got home, we knew he had to be in a position to see our driveway. But every day after school, I would let myself in the side door using a key that was hidden outside. It was extremely well hidden and you'd have to be positioned in just the right spot to ever get to see me use it. But if you were hiding and watching, than it was possible. It became impossible not to think he may have been in our house, in my room, and that thought was simply unbearable. We obviously stopped leaving a key outside, but the very nature of the cycle, short bursts of intense contact, followed by months of nothing, made it hard to know what to do. He clearly knew how to avoid the trace, he was motivated enough to keep contacting me over such a long period of time, and he was controlled enough to wait for long stretches in between calls. I had never been someone who scared easily, and my dad didn't want me to lose that. He started keeping the guns in the house loaded and taking me to the shooting range. After Christmas, a quiet few months passed as always. I had stayed alert for a week or two, and then I quit thinking about it. On the first day of my summer break, I was home and in a great mood when the phone rang. Expecting a call from my best friend, I said, Hello? And I heard, I'm calling about the job you applied for. This is Randy. Followed by more unintelligible words. I actually had been applying for jobs, but as I said to the man, From where? It hit me that this was the exact conversation we had the first time he called. I hung up and prepared myself for another awful day. The calls kept coming and, as usual, in the process of trying to call my mom, 
I would end up on the phone with him. The things he would say got worse after every quiet spell, and by this time, he was describing how he was going to murder me. More than the things he was saying, the rage in his voice triggered a real fear in me. I was having trouble getting the line open long enough to call my mom. I knew he was watching close enough to be watching the house. I got the gun out of the closet, and I sat there by the ringing phone. I was wanting to call my mom, but I wasn't wanting the chance to hear his voice again. I wasn't panicky, but I was crying and definitely scared. And then, I was done. Just simply done. I picked up the phone and he launched into his sixth spiel, trying to get as much in as he could before I hung up again. But I didn't hang up. I'm not sure why. I didn't have a plan, but I sat there silent for a few minutes and let him talk. And when he said that he could be at my house in less than two minutes, without thinking about it for a second, I said, Come on over. The door's open. I then hung up the phone, walked over and unlocked and opened the front door, leaving just the screen door closed. With my gun in my hand, I sat down on the couch facing the door and waited. He never came, and he never called again. There is zero doubt in my mind that if he had walked onto that porch, I would have shot him without hesitation. I still have no idea who it was, or why, or whether it would have escalated beyond phone calls. I went off to college, and my parents eventually moved out of that house, so I suppose it will forever be a mystery. I trust that God will give him what he deserves, but I definitely learned that people who feed off your fear disappear quickly when you quit being afraid. Back in college, my friends and I got into the habit of exploring abandoned buildings. We've seen some incredible places and have gotten some pretty cool souvenirs. I don't really condone taking stuff from some buildings, but if it is about to be torn down and contractors have taken out everything they deem to be worth something, then I'll gladly take that depressing glass they left behind. I digress. It's a small group of friends that go exploring with me, and I love introducing new people to it. A friend of mine had asked me on several occasions if I could take him somewhere, because he had never gone exploring before. I would take him to an old paper factory that didn't have much inside, but had an absolutely beautiful view of the city from the roof. Also, it was incredibly easy to get in and out of. We went with a few other people, but two of my friends had decided to wait outside for us, since they had been in the building a few too many times to find it interesting anymore. As we went to climb inside, a drunk couple came out. It's not unusual. A lot of people use the building to smoke, drink, or paint in. We asked them if there were many people inside. They said they thought it was mostly empty, but they had heard some banging around a few floors up that startled them out. They said the person sounded angry, and maybe we should avoid the roof. Since we weren't there to drink or anything, the roof was our only goal. We decided we'll take our chances and head up. After all, it is a massive building, and we didn't think we would run into the guy. We walk up ten flights of stairs and then climb the ladder to the roof. My friend is impressed and the view is awesome. As we're about to head back down, my friend waiting on the street calls us. He said that a man is passed out in the street, and the two of them pulled him out of the way of traffic and called an ambulance for him. They suggest we waited out on the roof to avoid exiting the building while the cops were there. Neither of us can afford the $5,000 fine or a week jail time just for looking at the city from an abandoned building. We wait, but we probably shouldn't have waited on the roof. We get the all clear for my friend to come back down and we head to the ladder. My friend goes first, and then our flashlight dies. The ladder is tricky to get onto when you can't see it, and it's missing some rungs, so I come down very slowly in the dark, afraid of hurting myself. I hop down and my friend tells me very quietly that he hears someone in the room next to us. I shrug it off. We already know people are in the building. Then, 
the screaming starts. At first, it almost sounds like one of my friends who waited outside yelling my name. I hesitated at the top of the stairs, just outside the door of the room the screaming is coming from, trying to decide if it's him and if he's playing some sort of prank. The guy I came into the building with grabs my wrists and we start running down the stairs. At this point, it's obvious it's not my friend. It's just this guttural, intense screaming. We start running down the stairs and then hear really loud banging to go with the screaming. It sounds like this guy has a very heavy object that he's swinging at the walls and exposed pipes with. The stairs are the only way down. Every other way is out of order freight elevators. So we are trapped in this stairwell, and it's ten flights till we reach the ground floor, and we have to book it to the opposite side of this factory, and back out the hole we climbed through. Besides screaming and swinging that heavy object, we hear him barreling down the stairs behind us, but at least he's one floor behind. Whatever he is using to hit the walls and pipes with is clearly enough to do some damage to our skulls, because a bit of brick chipped off the wall follows us down the steps, and that's when my friend grabs my wrist again and throws me through the nearest door. We've only made it down three floors. At the beginning of each flight of stairs, there's this one door that opens onto the entire level. In other words, it's painfully obvious where we've gone. After flying into this room, we notice it's been gutted like every other floor. But more of the windows are boarded up, and it's very dark. All that's in the room to hide behind are some pillars. We get behind one and huddle together. This guy stops outside the doorway to the room we are hiding in, and he is still screaming. It's terrifying. Then he starts swinging his weapon around and slamming it into the door frame. We're sure he's going to come in. The only way out is the door he's currently standing in. Neither of us ever look around the pillar to see the guy, and we have no idea what his weapon is. Nearly four minutes passed and he hasn't stopped screaming. For whatever reason, he doesn't come into the room we're in, but he starts running down the stairs. We can hear him hitting pipes and smacking the walls, and we just wait. We have seven floors to go down. We could pass him in any doorway on the way down. Eventually the screaming and banging stops, but we still think we should wait. That's when we hear something from a different corner of our room. There's just enough light from the window in the back that hasn't been boarded up, and we see a figure get up off the floor. This person has been in the room the entire seven or eight minutes we've been in there, and they haven't let on until now. This person, who is in front of the only light source, so we just see a totally black figure, is now shuffling towards us without making a sound. It is exactly like a zombie movie, and we run. We don't bother finding out what this person's deal is, and temporarily forget about the first, clearly dangerous guy. For an asthmatic, I hold down the stairs and never pause to catch my breath even once. As we're reaching the bottom of the stairwell, the screaming starts again. It's coming from the room next to us, but we don't stop running. The hole in the wall that we climb through to get into the building is yards away, and this man is crashing out of the room behind us. We never look back and climb through the hole so fast, I don't even remember doing it. Our two friends were waiting for us, and we throw ourselves into the car. They asked what happened, because apparently the man was so loud that they could hear him screaming and breaking things from outside the building. They thought we were making all that noise, and were going to give it a few minutes before calling us to remind us that the police were still patrolling the area for drunk, underage college students and we should probably shut up. We tell them what happened, and then decide to carry on with our plans for the night, because a beer was totally necessary after that. This happened about 15 years ago. My friends and I decided to explore an old abandoned college. After searching around the college for a while, 
we finally came across something that chilled us. It was a room covered in bloodstains, blood on the curtains and on the walls. Terrified, we took off out of there so fast. We didn't even think to call the cops as, at the time, we were 16 years old, trespassing and terrified. We drove back there a week later out of curiosity. The entire area was roped off. There were crime scene vehicles everywhere. I tried to put it out of my mind after that. The building was six floors or so, so who knows what else we didn't see. When I was 15 years old, my family and I traveled to Switzerland. I am the youngest of three brothers and would always go exploring when on family vacations. This time we were staying at the base of a mountain, and one night, my brothers and I decided to go walk around outside a bit. We ended up stumbling on this cave that had signs all around it saying, Entrance Forbidden. Being three teenagers, we of course decided to check it out. We started walking into this cave, and about 20 to 30 feet deep, it became incredibly dark and cold. We slowed down and decided we probably shouldn't go any further. Just as I was about to turn around, I felt something brush against my hand. I told my brothers to stop and that it wasn't funny, but they were all far enough away that it could not have been them. I then reached out in front of me and felt this wet, furry thing. At this point, I started to panic, but I remembered I had a flashlight in my backpack, so I grabbed it. I turned the light on, and to my horror, I saw rows and rows of deer hanging upside down, their stomachs cut wide open. And even worse, they were all still dripping blood, which I realized then was all over my hands. I guess some deer hunters had hung the deer up and apparently this had happened pretty recently. Either way, we ran out there like our lives depended on it and never told our parents. It was definitely one of the creepier things I've seen. The other day, a couple of friends and I decided to explore an abandoned nursing home. It had also once been a polio hospital in the next town over. While in the basement, we came across a crawl space which we soon discovered led to a larger room. The room had a perfectly cut 5 foot by 5 foot square in the middle, about 10 foot in depth, filled to the brim with water. It was so perfectly still and clear that we questioned if it was glass at first. We couldn't figure out how the pool filled up with water because the room didn't have any openings or holes in the ceiling for possible rainfall and the rest of the room didn't show any signs of flooding. What's creepier is that at the bottom of the pool there was a cage the size of a small crate. I was 16, and my best friend and I were wandering through the abandoned asylum grounds right by my house. There was one tall tower that had been dark and locked up for as long as I could remember. This time though, something was different. At the very top, there was a light on, and we heard a strange barking noise. At first, I thought it was coming from elsewhere, maybe someone walking their dog in the area, but it soon became apparent that no. The sound was coming from the top of the tower. We hesitantly looked up and there was a silhouette in the window. The barking was coming from a person. Without even thinking, we took off running. Behind us, the person called out in a sing-song voice. Bye now. I stayed away from that place for a good few years after that. When I was about 13 years old, two friends and I were walking down to an old abandoned train tunnel. 
about a mile long. It was kind of like a rite of passage in the village I grew up in to walk through without any light from a torch. Being the responsible kids we were, we decided we should tell an adult. So we told a local roofer we passed on the way down to the tunnel, someone we also knew from the village. We told him where we were going, in case of any injuries and that kind of thing. He told us not to go, warning us that it was haunted and whatnot. Being 13, we called bullshit and said, we're not scared. We proceeded, and as we got halfway down the tunnel, we heard a loud, revving noise. I thought it was a quad bike or something, but when I turned around, I saw a perfectly silhouetted man at the entrance behind us, with a fucking chainsaw. Now I don't know if you've ever run like your life depended on it, but Usain Bolt could not have beaten me over the last half mile. My father owned a pub at the time, and we ran back into the pub scared shitless in broad daylight. We told him what happened. He didn't seem shocked enough to be honest, he just sort of nodded sagely. It turns out the roofer followed us down there, and he decided to fuck with us. He had beat us to the pub and told my dad, who fell about laughing. When I was younger, there was this abandoned house that my friends and I came across. We thought it was super cool and it had become quite the attraction. We shared it with other people we thought would find it cool. We hung out there quite a lot and got pretty comfortable being there. Maybe too comfortable. One day my buddy and I were there hanging out. Everything was normal. We left for two hours and met up with some other buddies and some girls. We decided we would take them to see the house that night. When we returned, it could have only been three to four hours since we had left but things were seriously different. I was starting to freak out a bit, because everyone was just meandering around slowly, exploring as usual and brushing off my, no guys, this is seriously different, thinking I'm just trying to spook them. I followed them to the end of the hall, because, I mean, I'm a bit curious too. A spare mattress had been dragged in front of the door. Like dumbasses, we called out. No one answered, so we moved the mattress, walking into one of the rooms. There, we found another mattress, propped up on the wall with a dirty magazine taped to it, with arrows through them. Not like the arrows you can buy, but they looked almost homemade with self-sharpened tips. There were various items not previously there, like a knife and a flashlight. We all stopped dead in our tracks. I poked my head out the window trying to figure out who had set it all up. As I did, I heard someone running away. We quickly decided to do the same and nope the fuck out of there. What was really scary to me was that I hung out there quite a lot. I was there all the time, and to do that much work with the arrows and dirty magazines, there is no way he didn't know the place as well as I did. But we never ran into each other, thank God. It started just as all of our other urban exploration trips did. My reckless self and equally reckless friend had to make the long 40 minute drive, finally reaching our destination at a little past two. Fort Worth, Texas, home to the main street silos. After sizing up the impressive dilapidated structures that we sought to explore, we exited the car and set out on the short walk to the silo. The path required us to cross three sets of railroad tracks surrounded by an overgrowth of wild grass and plants. It didn't look difficult, but the most treacherous obstacles were the small ditches between every track, filled with water along with scattered debris and rocks. As we got closer, eyeing the easiest route through the tracks, a voice called out to us from below an overpass. Hey! Instantly, we both recoiled back as this had been our first encounter with another person on one of our trips. My friend and I looked at each other in disbelief until the voice called out again. 
Oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. I didn't mean to scare you. Relieved, we realized this voice belonged to a homeless lady taking refuge on a mattress nearby. My buddy casually called out and explained that we were just exploring, and that was that. We continued, crossing the track slowly and carefully. We came to the site that we had long awaited. As per usual, the two of us began to investigate our surroundings, looking for any entrances or points of interest. This went on for some time, until we found an open window in Silo 1 that led to a room within. In that room there wasn't much to see, except for a rusty ladder attached to the wall. The only way to go was up. However reckless we might be, we decided it wasn't worth the risk without investigating the rest of the site. Exiting the same way we came in, we resumed our path and decided to explore Silos 2 and 3. We couldn't find anything of interest or any way in, so we figured the latter might be our best bet. As we were looping around to Silo 1, my heart dropped. I grabbed the arm of my friend and pointed them towards the way we had just come from. Two flashlights were bobbing up and down at the other end of the silos. Lights out, my friend whispered to me. Neither of us wanted to risk being seen by these individuals. We looked at each other, frantically exchanging guesses as to whom these people might be. Cops, homeless, other explorers. Our eyes glued to the unexpected visitors. It quickly became clear that they were making their way over to us in a rather swift manner. We continued to creep back, but the lights kept advancing. Only they were gaining pace. My partner looked at me, somehow shouting and whispering at the same time. Fuck it. Run. We sprinted for the railroads practically hurtling over the ditches that we'd so carefully crossed before. Looking behind, the lights had made their way to where we were when we initially spotted them. We lowered ourselves between the ditches to hide from the unknown. After what seemed like hours, we peeked our heads up to see if they were still there. Nothing. Wherever they had gone, they weren't there anymore, and their lights were out. It was as if they disappeared into thin air. Collecting ourselves, we made the joint decision to try to flank them. The two of us made our way to the far side of Silo 3. It was here that we noted the overpass had a sidewalk that started there. It could be used as a safe route back to the car. Next to the sidewalk, we stumbled upon what could have been the old office building the silo used. It was abandoned and no longer in use, but that didn't interest us. We silently examined a chain-link fence connected to the building in Silo 3. There was an open gate in the fence that would lead us behind where the lights had once been. Taking a deep breath, we passed through the gate and completed our flank of the individuals. There was still nothing to be found. It was just us and the dead silence hanging in the air. Despite our nerves, we resumed our mission and continued to explore as normal. We cleared the whole area and looped back to the left side of Silo 2. Moments later, my partner noted a cryptic three-foot opening in Silo 2. We took the liberty to turn our flashlights back on and investigate the strange opening. It was then that my partner had alerted me of an ajar door within the opening. Our backs against the wall, we made the most nerve-wracking and off-putting entry in our history of urban exploration. The door only led to a claustrophobic room that someone had once called home, as we noted blankets and water bottles scattered around. There wasn't much to see, so my partner and I turned back around to leave the room, when both of us looked at each other. Did you hear that? I asked my friend. My ears weren't deceiving me. We both heard the same thing, and it was very close. A footstep. Whoever the hell it is, someone is still nearby, and they know that we are here. Immediately we killed the lights and listened. Nothing. An eternity had passed with nothing but dead silence filling our ears. Finally we decided to exit the room and see if anyone was outside. I peeked my head out the door and looked both left and right. I saw nothing. It was then that I began to slowly exit the room and head back in between Silo 1 and 2. I mentioned to my friend that it was safe, and we began making our way to the end of the silos to continue exploring. 
trying to get away from that area. Then, suddenly, headlights illuminated the wall of the old office building near the end of the silos. Red beams of light danced across the walls of our surroundings. Panicking, we both dropped in the brush and crawled to the side of the silo to avoid being seen. It was just a work truck passing right in front of us, moving towards the work site behind the silos. After the truck had left, my friend and I had both decided that we'd had quite enough. We headed towards the railroads. As we were about to leave the area, my friend suggested that we get a few pictures before departing, so we went back towards the path between silo 1 and 2 to get a few cool shots. The last of the pictures we wanted were selfie style, in front of the barred off entry points. While trying to get the right angles, we heard a strange noise that almost seemed to come from inside the room behind us. Having had our fair share of terrifying experiences that night, we decided it was time to pick up and head out. Making our way back to the railroads, we heard a roar in the distance. It couldn't be. It was chugging along the track closest to the car. A train. A train passing by meant that our safest path back to the car would be blocked off by thousands of tons of speeding steel. My partner wasn't faced and told me to continue heading towards the train, as it would simply pass by soon and we could safely get across. It was only when we got closer to the train that we heard it. There's absolutely no way this train wasn't going anywhere. In fact, it had stopped right then and there. The dividing line between us and the car. Almost instantly, another train came and was braking on the track closest to us. Not wanting to take our chances with the truck we saw working near the overpass sidewalk, we decided that however stupid it might be, when the second train stops, we should hop over and in between the carts and book it to the car. Patiently camping along the tracks, we waited to hurl ourselves onto the closest cart and readily make our escape. This would have worked out if our luck wasn't shitty that night. Another roar emerged from the distance. A third train made its way along the middle track and began to break. These were freight trains, so breaking to a full stop was far from immediate. It was at this point my partner and I were in sheer panic. Waiting for this train to stop was a no-go. We were sitting ducks in the area where freeloaders and train hoppers ran rampant. We spotted another overpass in the distance and figured this would be our escape. It was the only way for us to go, and was away from the tracks, but it wasn't towards the silos. This next scene was something straight out of a movie. We had to stride through chest-high bushes and wild grasses to make our way towards safety, running as fast as we could while battling off the vegetation. I yelled for my friend to hold up as the overgrowth managed to remove and swallow my shoe. After a frantic search, we found the shoe and continued our pace. At this point, we realized the impossible. To get to the end of this seemingly endless overpass, we had to cross yet another railroad with another train on its way. It seemed like there was literally no way out. We kept getting screwed from every direction. After another moment's panic, I made the executive decision to head back to the silos. The pair of us started alongside yet another set of tracks that ran through the train yard next to the silos. Both of us being absolutely gassed from running, we slowed the pace and jogged back to the silo while collecting our sanity. The shit show just kept piling up. A horn sounded from behind in the distance, and the tracks we were following suddenly became illuminated in the horizon. They just kept coming. We had to outrun a train. Finding the last bit of energy, we sprinted until we could hop off the tracks and return to the silos. Moments after, the train passed. The sinister place that was home to the dangerous unknown had now become our safe haven. We had nowhere else to go other than back to the chain link fence and to the sidewalk of the overpass leading back to the car. With no choice but to risk running into someone, the two of us ventured over to the fence. At this point, we were both satisfied with being alive. We threw caution to the wind. We made it to the overpass sidewalk safely and did a victory dance. We finally made our trek back to the car, and then there was a scream. The sound echoed across the walls of the silo. We had walked halfway across the overpass, admiring our surroundings and coming back to reality. 
We stopped in our tracks when we heard the ominous screech. It sounded as if it was from inside the silos, a child screaming in agony. And then we heard it again. An identical screech resonated once again, but this time coming from the houses on the other side of the overpass. It was someone's rooster, Coy, in the early morning. It was 4 a.m. It was time to go home. This took place in May, a state in northeastern USA, at around 2007 or 2008. I was in third or fourth grade, and just for fun, joined the local community service soccer teams with my friends from school. Usually one of the parents of the team would coach, and another parent would act as an assistant coach. But on this day, the assistant coach was sick, so the community service center sent in this other middle-aged woman to act as a sub for our assistant coach. Well, this day also happened to be one of our teammates, Mel's, birthday. She was having a big sleepover party where the whole team was invited. It was all we were talking about during the game, and Mel was a really close friend of mine. This would be the first time sleeping at her house, so I was really excited. We all were. During the game, I was talking to Mel about the sleepover party later. The assistant coach woman, who I'd never met before, called my name out. She waved me over to her. I have always prided myself on having good intuition, and this was one of those moments. For some reason, I just got a really bad feeling in my stomach, but I listened and I went over to her. As I stood about a foot away from her, she wiggled her finger in a motion to get me to come closer to her. That's when alarm bells started going off in my head even more. So I leaned in, just ever so slightly closer, because I was too uncomfortable to step forward. Once I lean in a little bit, I think she noticed I didn't want to step closer, so she leaned in too. She whispered to me, So, I'm Mel's mom. I'm going to be taking you to the sleepover party after the game. So come right with me to my car as soon as the game's over. Okay? And I don't know why, but I really felt off about this. I hadn't met Mel's mom before. She was indeed supposed to be picking me and Mel up to bring us back to the party after the game. But it just felt wrong. So I stuck to Mel's side like Velcro the rest of the game. And as soon as it was over, I told Mel that we should run to her mom's car and I'll explain. So we take off in a sprint. Mel leads me to her mom's car and we both hop in. But as her mom turns around, my eyes widen. I say, wait, are you Mel's mom? She looked confused and said something along the lines of, Yes, of course. Why? And that's when my heart sunk. Mel's mom was not the assistant coach stand-in lady, and I told Mel's real mom what happened. She was pretty concerned, but never did anything about it that I know of. I told my family about it the next day, but only my grandmother believed me. Nothing ever was done to find this lady, or figure out why she was trying to impersonate my friend's mom to lure me into her vehicle. I just thought I'd share this, because this situation really stuck with me. I've always worried that she may be tried again, and succeeded with another child. I've since searched the internet for cases of children, particularly young girls around 3rd or 4th grade, going missing from schools or community service events. I haven't found any that resonate with what happened to me, but that doesn't mean that they're not out there. It's so creepy. I'll never know what she planned on doing with me. I'm glad my instincts felt something off, and I really hope no other children fell victim. But what are the odds she never tried that again? I don't know. It's just so strange. You have an idea in your mind of what creepers look like, but then an average-looking middle-aged woman comes out of nowhere to try and scoop you up. So to preface this, I'm a male and I was 21 years old at the time. I'm 6 foot 2 and 240 pounds. I'm not a small or a weak looking guy. 
I was wanting to lose some weight for a while now, and I'd been going for walks for a bit, sometimes during the evening or very late at night. It was Florida, and it gets hot unless it's nighttime. Plus, like I said, I'm a big guy. I don't have anything to worry about, or so I thought. One fateful night, I decided to go out walking around my neighborhood at around 3 a.m. in a big puffy jacket and black pants. My walk was going good as usual, and I was actually close to getting to the end of it. Then this old school wood-paneled van passes by. It goes into a driveway somewhat in front of me. I barely think anything of it. There's usually three to six cars that go by on one of these late-night excursions. What happens next is what unsettled me. This fucking van pulls back out of the driveway with its lights off after I pass by. Luckily I wasn't listening to any music, or else I wouldn't have heard it. The van then proceeds to pull out and drive towards me. It stops right in front of me. At this point, I don't want to end up like some kind of horror movie character, so I book it in the opposite direction. I go down an off-branching street and keep going down these random streets to give me as much time as possible. I end up hiding in some random ass bushes in someone's yard and I stay there for a bit. I wanted to text my mom, but I was scared. I didn't want the light from my phone to give me away, so I watch for any sign of them. Nothing for five minutes. Just as you think the coast is clear, boom. I hear a car coming down the street. It's those fucks, but with their lights on this time. I'm pretty hidden in these bushes right against someone's house. So they just go by, but my heart is beating so fast and I'm terrified in this moment. I wait a bit more until I truly believe the coast is clear. When it is clear, I go back to my house. I wake up my mom and we call the cops. I give them as much information as possible. They said they would patrol the neighborhood and I don't hear anything more. I just can't help thinking about that event, what their motives were. I always try to debunk shit like that, but all their actions pointed to wanting to do something with me. What did they want to do? I'm not a pretty young lady. I'm a very large, menacing guy. My neighborhood isn't even nice enough to rob. What am I even going to have on me while walking at 2am? I just can't help but think that maybe they didn't want to kidnap me or mug me, but kill me. It still freaks me out to this day. This happened when I was about 18 years old. I was big into running back then, and I lived in a town that was a suburb, but had big swathes of farmland. I preferred running on the dirt at the edges of these fields, because it was a lot easier on my legs than running long distances on concrete or asphalt, and I was usually training for half marathons. This particular day, I was planning to run an easy six miles. I told my mom, and she suggested I do a loop and meet them at the dog park about three miles from our house, as my halfway point. This is pre-cell phone era, but being careful, I took a walkie-talkie my dad always used, and my mom took the other one. The walkie-talkie had a range longer than the ones my brothers and I played around with when we were younger, but it definitely did not work three miles away. I honestly had no idea what its exact range was, so I take off on my run. I'm planning to go on the sidewalk for a bit until I get to the fields. I'm running in the dirt with the road a few yards to my left. I had to run south and then turn right onto a slightly smaller, less traveled road to get to the dog park. As I'm running on the first dirt part, my parents drive by and being dorks, they honk and wave and yell at me. I wave and then soon after take my turn onto the smaller road. This one is road, me on flat dirt, small drainage ditch, forever of lettuce field, then a wall that is the backyard of some houses. I start noticing how quiet this street is, and how few cars are passing me. Then I randomly start thinking to myself, if someone tried to do something, I could run to those houses. No, they're so far away, I'd never make it. Then I hear a call. But this one doesn't pass me like all the others. I hear it slow down so that it's just behind me, just out of my peripheral vision. My senses go into alert 
and I immediately realized what a dumbass I was to pick this route because I'm stuck out here with no one to help me and nowhere to hide. The car starts speeding up enough so that it's next to me. I glance over and see a man. He's middle-aged, white, with dark hair, totally normal looking, but I get a chill down my spine immediately. He sort of leans over into the passenger seat and says in a super sweet voice, Hi, where are you going? Do you need a ride? I'm scared and I realize this is not good. Admittedly, nothing has happened yet and he could be innocently just wanting to chat, but my intuition is in overdrive telling me that I'm not safe. I hop over the ditch, thinking it will at least make it harder for his car to follow me, if I need to take across the field to try to make it to one of those houses in the distance. This pisses him off. He guns it, and gets closer to the ditch in front of where I am. He then says in a voice I can only describe as bone-chillingly evil, You know, you shouldn't be out here all alone. Something horrible could happen to you out here, and no one would ever know where to find you. He's put his car in park and is taking off his seatbelt. When I remember the walkie-talkie, the piece of shit is still static because I'm too far away, so I immediately turn down the volume and say loudly, Hey dad, yeah, yeah, I see your car. I'm over here by this red Buick. Do you see me? And I waved off into the distance. There was no car coming from the direction my parents were, and when I had started talking, there was no one behind us either. But by the grace of the universe at that exact moment, a car turned onto the road. The guy saw it, looked at me, and sped off so fast he left skid marks. I have never run faster in my life. I was looking behind me every few seconds, and thought he'd be waiting for me at every intersection I had to cross. I was shaking, I was so scared. I was relieved when I got to that dog park. I told my parents everything, and my mom called the police. They took a statement, but said it will just help if something actually happened to someone else. The weird part was, I was having trouble getting my story out. I was so upset, and before I even gave a description of the car, the cop asked, was it a red Buick? He wouldn't tell us why. But that just added to my feeling that I just narrowly escaped something awful. I'll start by saying I have a terrible biological father. He's been a shady person all of my life and constantly caused me a lot of grief. This is just one of those examples. When I was four, my parents split up, my mother and I moved states, and they agreed I would visit my dad every school holiday for a week. This one particular time, I had been with him for a few days when I was playing with my cousin at a nearby park. A car pulled up, and I recognized the man as one of my dad's friends. He called me over, and without thinking, I ran over to him and left my cousin at the park. He asked me if I could show him where my dad lived. I agreed and got into his car. I gave directions and didn't notice at all that they weren't following them correctly. After way too long, I did realize that we were getting closer to the city, which is far from my dad's house. We pulled up at a house I didn't recognize. The man told me to wait in the car. I did. I didn't feel scared at all for some reason. He eventually took me inside, and then I definitely started to feel unsafe. I mainly remember there were two girls that were passed out, and a much older man was there next to them. I made eye contact with this man, and he made me feel sick to my stomach. I had definitely figured out that this was a bad situation by this point. A lady took me into a bedroom and brought me a sandwich. The bread was stale and I wasn't hungry, but I ate it all because I felt bad for her. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what I was thinking about. The lady told me a lot of things I didn't understand, but when she left, I remember thinking my dad was coming to pick me up soon. I fell asleep waiting for him. I wet the bed that night, and no one came to see me the next day until I cried very loudly and banged on the door. 
The lady came back and yelled at me for stinking up her bedroom. I asked about my dad. She said he was coming tonight after he finished work. She didn't offer me a shower or a bath, so I sat in my soiled pants all day. After all of that, everything turned into a blur, really. My dad didn't come to get me that night, and I was so terrified. In my head, I felt like I was there for months. I thought I was missing school, and everyone had forgotten about me. In reality, I was there for five days. They let me take one shower. I don't remember eating much except for boring sandwiches, and I had chips and gravy once. Finally, my mom drove across the country to come and get me. After not being able to get a hold of my dad for so long, and then me missing my pre-booked flight home, she panicked and came looking for me. Thank God she did. She found my dad at his girlfriend's house, methed out completely, hiding out. Turns out, he owed a lot of drug money to the people who had taken me. They told him that they had me, but he couldn't afford it, or didn't want me back. Whatever it was, he didn't bother to try to get me back. My amazing mom paid his debt for him after borrowing from a lot of people. She came to get me back. I remember when someone came into that room and told me my mom was here. I walked out and I could smell her. It was the best feeling to feel safe again. She took me home and I didn't see my dad for a long time. She never called the police. My parents' relationship was very complicated then and I fully understand the choices she made. I'm definitely okay now. I've spoken about this in therapy and I've come to terms with most of the things I went through as a child but it's still a fucked up situation for a four-year-old girl to have to be in. This happened about three years ago when I was 18. At the time, we lived in a kind of strange city with a decently high crime rate. It was more of an industrial town. The only things close by were U-Haul, gas station, grocery stores, and a bunch of construction and manufacturing type businesses or abandoned buildings. My partner worked at the 7-Eleven just a half mile up the road or so. I drove him to work and picked him up since he worked the night shift. I didn't feel comfortable letting him walk to and from. It was around midnight or so on one of his work nights. He'd asked me to come visit since they weren't extremely busy. The side of the building where I parked was in a blind spot as far as surveillance goes but I parked over here to free up parking in front of the building since I anticipated on staying a while. There weren't a ton of vehicles, only a few scattered around the parking lot, including a white, fairly new-looking pickup truck near where I had parked. An older man, probably around his late 30s, early 40s, was standing near the truck, and I had to walk past him to get into the building. When I went to walk by, he stopped me, standing partially in the walkway. At first, I wasn't really uncomfortable, just moderately annoyed since I don't enjoy talking to strangers. He started telling me how his truck wasn't working and he couldn't get it to start. I didn't really question it. I dismissed him by saying I knew nothing about cars, so there was nothing I could do to help him. He was pretty persistent after this, asking me to come look and telling me about how it wouldn't work, how he needed my help and whatnot. By this point, I was pretty weirded out since I'd said at least two or three times that I know nothing about cars, so I don't see how it would be helpful in any way. He also asked what I was doing out this late. I told him my boyfriend worked there and I was coming to visit. He looked noticeably uncomfortable at that. I took my chance and quickly walked into the gas station and got my partner to come out. Without any hesitation, the guy jumped in his truck and immediately sped off, suspiciously fast. All in all, it was just super weird. I don't know what would have happened if I had gotten any closer to that vehicle, being as it was working just fine. Nothing ever came of it, and I didn't get his license plate number, since I would have had to either go around the back of his truck, which was dangerous and he would have noticed, or I would have had to have gotten it when he was pulling off. But he reversed and just sped down the dark road, so there was no way to see it.
When I was 17, I worked in a large mall at Vans. I had a lot of creepy older guys come in and flirt with me, but one guy took the cake. One day I was working the usual busy as hell Saturday nights, and there were four very tall men that asked for my help getting shoes. I worked at an outlet, so the store was large with tall racks. The mall I worked in was extremely popular amongst locals and tourists alike. The mall has some history with being a sex trafficking hotspot for some context. So anyway, the men said they were from Nigeria and they were pretty chill at first, until they began to flirt. One of the men kept saying he has a son in Nigeria and asked if I wanted to wed him. I laughed because I thought he was joking, but suddenly he looked extremely offended. I was awkward and began talking about the shoes, but the man interrupted me with saying how great his son was and that I would make a great wife. At that point I grew uncomfortable because I didn't want to be rude, so I asked for a co-worker to come over and take care of them while I went to the bathroom. Everything was normal for the remainder of my shift. I clocked out and I was waiting for my dad to come pick me up. I usually walked around the halls of the mall as I waited. The music was soothing and all was calm. I walked past a restroom hall and saw figures standing in my peripheral. I glanced and saw that it was the four men from earlier. I was in full on panic mode at that point, but I played it off. I smiled at them softly and kept walking so they didn't think I was being rude. Sure enough, they began to follow me. I picked up my pace hoping to find other people walking around, but there was no one. I was speed walking, but these guys were keeping pace with me. My thoughts were just to go to the bathroom so I could lose them, so I entered the next restroom hall. I walked slowly, thinking I had lost them, but soon after I heard pounding footsteps in a hurry. I looked back and they were coming right for me. I didn't think the bathroom was an option anymore. I started yelling for help. I ran straight for the employee corridors of the mall. Right when I got through the doors, a security guard met me on the other side. I bumped into him, and I never felt more relieved in my life. The men took off the other way, and the guard let me stay in his office until my dad came. Thank God for the guard. If he wasn't there, I probably wouldn't be telling this right now. My blood still runs cold when I think about it. My brother wanted to get a drink from a place we both love to go to. It was going to close soon and he had work to do, so I went by myself. It wasn't very late, but it was already dark. My parents had drummed into me since birth about the dangers of walking alone at night. I was kind of nervous that day, even though I've done it many times before. So I went and got both drinks, and for some reason I didn't get a bag. I was walking along with both hands full. As I was walking towards the street where my house was, I suddenly became aware of two men very near me. One was in front of me, wearing a maroon pullover, and the other was behind me, wearing a grey zipped up hoodie with the hood pulled up. I only turned around for a flash of a second, so I couldn't describe his face. I was weirded out because I was walking between them. I was beginning to feel uncomfortable like they were trying to hurt me, and just as I was telling myself that I was clearly overreacting, I came across a garage that was down an alleyway. A black Subaru was coming out. I had time, so I crossed before they reached me. The person inside clearly wasn't counting on me doing that, so they swung around and parallel parked next to me, at most two feet away. So now I was between three men and a wall. When I saw the door open, that was it for me. I bolted and didn't stop running until I reached my house. This story happened when I was around 11 or 12 years old. I was finally on summer break. Me and my best friend, whom I've met on the internet, made plans for me to stay at her place for a week. She lived in a city about two and a half hours away from me, but I've met her before in real life, 
so everything was fine. On that day, I took the train by myself, which was not a new experience for me since my mom let me have a lot of freedom and experience. I texted my friend the time and place I'd arrive, but the city was so huge that I got the name of the station mixed up, which led to her going somewhere else instead of where I was. But at the time, I obviously didn't know. So when I arrived, I just took my suitcase and went to a quiet corner to wait for her while watching all the busy people running from A to B. My friend texted me, asking me where I was, and after going back and forth, we figured out it was my fault for telling her the wrong station, but she was on her way to pick me up. After waiting for a few minutes, a man in his 30s accidentally bumped into me even though I was just standing still. He apologized a thousand times. I assured him it was fine and nothing happened, but he insisted on making it up to me and wanted to buy me a hot chocolate or something to eat. I refused, but I was also a pretty shy girl back then and wasn't taken seriously many times. He seemed pretty frustrated at this point and decided to just grab my hand. He tried to drag me away with him, and only then I realized what his intentions were. I felt scared. No one else around seemed to notice what was going on, but like a miracle, my friend just arrived on time and came straight over to me. I was calling her name, which made the guy realize I wasn't alone anymore, so he took off as fast as he could without saying anything. I took a road trip to Miami with my husband, my three-year-old daughter, mother-in-law, and father-in-law. I'm never called by my name when we're together. I'm called Mommy, Babe, and Miha. We stayed in a really nice hotel in downtown Miami that required a key card for the elevator to go to each floor. This hotel also asked ID for everyone that was staying. Me, my daughter, and my husband share a room. At 12 a.m., someone banged on my door and woke us up. My husband looked through the peephole and sees a man on either side of the door. He asked him what he wanted. We're on vacation, and the only people we know is in the next room. The man responds in a deep, foreign voice. Jane Doe. Me and my husband look at each other. My husband asks him what he wants, and he tells us that he wants to talk to me. My husband asks him what about. The guy once again tells him to open the door so that he can talk to me. We tell him to go away or we will call the police. The guy walks away. We went and stayed with his parents for the night. The next morning we were checking out and informed the front desk. They stated that it's impossible, that the only way people can get onto the floor is if they have a room on that floor or if they work there. They asked if we had any other friends nearby. We told them that we did not. The guy behind the counter stated that there was a big concert last night on the beach across the street. I will never go to Miami again. I am from a small town in Northern California. It's a very tight-knit community with low crime and a high average income compared to the surrounding areas, so high-profile events happen infrequently. But when they do, news and gossip spread like wildfire. This event happened to me when I was in middle school, around 2009. One week, I remember suddenly everyone was talking about the mummy that was found in a house in our town. To keep what I'm sure is a long story short, an 86-year-old woman had died in her home. Her adult daughter had kept her propped up in her chair, in the same position she died in. Four years. Some reports say two years. Some reports say up to five years. The police and investigators were unsure of what she actually died of. The last in-person sighting of her was around four years before her body's discovery. Her social security checks were being cashed up, until the police were called for a wellness check. Her adult daughter, also a resident of the town, became the main suspect. Not for murder, but for interfering with a dead body and for fraud. The thing was, her daughter had actively been going in and out of her mother's house for years, keeping up the exterior, tending to the garden, paying the bills, making excuses and fabricating stories for why no one had seen her mother. 
all while her mother's remains sat in the living room, decomposing. And while the daughter was investigated for various offenses, she was never arrested or charged. I'm truly not sure why. Perhaps money. Perhaps she knew the right people in the police department. But it was never followed through with. The truly crazy part of this story is that soon after this discovery, the daughter ran for city council. Everyone knew exactly what happened. But she was loudly and proudly vying for a seat in our town's government. She moved into her mother's house and planted a vote sign on the front lawn. She didn't win, but continues to run in each election to this day. Whenever I'm home for the holidays, I often see her out on the front lawn of her mother's house, watering plants, always wearing a cardigan buttoned up to the chin, and a black sun hat, no matter the weather. And the best part, the platform she runs on for the city council bids, Extending aid to the community's elderly. When I was 17, I lived in a small village of 1,200 people. Usually every year, there's a local town festival, and all the adults go for dinner and party at the town hall. That's why they perform some kind of acting and make fun of the year that just passed. Usually this is in February, so it's snowy and dark pretty early. When the festival is on, all the 13 to 17 year old girls are booked for babysitting. Me and my two friends went for a drive around town since you have to be 18 to go to the party. So we just drove around giving people a lift to the party to earn some extra cash. It was a good idea since there is no taxi rank in this town. It was a great way to earn some extra pocket money. We'd been driving for a couple of hours, and of course we knew where everyone lived. Some of the adults asked us to drive past their house to make sure everything is alright, and give the parents some extra comfort. In one of the older neighborhoods in the town, there were low floodlights, so we just drove slowly, and one mom who we gave a lift earlier lived there. She was a widow with three young children, two, four, and eight, if I recall correctly and her niece was babysitting, who was 15 at the time. The time was around 10 p.m., and when we drove into this neighborhood, which is surrounded by hill and some cliffs, my friend swore that he saw something move in her garden. We thought little of it, and just said it was probably a cat or something. We kept driving to the other end of town, but my friend in the back seat said that he had a bad feeling. He wanted to drive back to her house and check if we could see some footprints in the snow. When we got back there, we parked the car and looked over the fence. There were fairly new footprints in the snow. We all looked at each other and decided to follow the trail. The trail went past all the bedrooms, but near every window the footprints were turned to it. It was like someone was trying to peek in. Eventually the trail ended on the street. We lost it where the snowplow had been earlier in the night. We chatted if we should go get the mom from the party or ring the doorbell to check if everything was alright. Since none of the tracks led to the back door or the front, we decided that two of us would stay in the neighborhood, remaining hidden and monitoring the house. The driver would drive back to the police station and pick up the mom on the way back. That was a good call. Maybe five minutes after the driver left, we saw someone lurking behind one of the garbage cans a couple houses down. He wasn't moving. He just sat there with a cigarette. We monitor from a distance since he couldn't see us. After a while, he stood up, looked around, and started to creep to the house where the mom lived. He walked over to the back door. Without thinking, me and my friend ran through the two gardens that were between where we were and the mom's house. We wanted to catch him trying to enter the back door. We arrived just in time. He was trying to open the back door. When we shouted to him, he made a run for it and we followed. He ran down the street to get some speed ahead of us, but me and my friend were both athletics, so we were gaining on him fast. This was the most intense moment of our life. I remember the only thing I was thinking was not to slip and lose momentum. The end of the street was approaching, and the next turn would be a 90 degree angle to the right. So instead of slowing down, I cut the corner so I could intercept him as he would lose speed by taking the turn. 
My calculations were wrong, and he managed to take the turn without losing much speed. I spent too much energy sprinting in 12 inches of snow. I knew I'd have to slow down. I was still about 10 meters behind him, but my friend was closer and gaining on him. When my friend realized he could kick his feet and trip him, he did. He fell, and this was the quickest takedown ever. His head smashed to the frozen ground, and he was out. While we were catching our breath, he didn't move. We rolled him over onto his back, and he was breathing, but really shallow. There was a sort of cracking noise. I was terrified. Millions of questions came to my head. Is he dying? What if this was just some relative doing a prank? Why did we chase him? Meanwhile, my friend checked his pocket, and there was lubricant, strong sedative, and a broken camera. Luckily, the driver arrived a couple of minutes later with the mom and the police. An ambulance was called. When it arrived, they took him away. The day after we were brought for questioning in the police station, the chief told us that he was a known sex offender, and we saved the day and probably more kids. Since the tumble he took when he fell to the ground caused him bleeding in the brain, he's not able to wipe his own ass anymore. We told him the story. And when my friend said he tripped him, the chief stopped typing and said, Are you sure you tripped him? The way I see it, you three heroes caught a burglar in the act. He was running away when he fell and hit his head. The chief looked at us and nodded with a soft smile. But back then, this pervert must have planned this. Knowing that the festival was on, knowing that she was a single mom, picking out the house, knowing where she'd be, Knowing that gives me the creeps. So, here's what happened. I'm at my parents' house with my mother, drinking coffee. I decided to drop by unexpectedly to spend some time with her, since I had worked a lot the weeks before, and I hadn't heard much from her. So we're talking when the intercom starts ringing. My mother goes to see, picks up the receiver, and there, the expression on her face changes. She seemed stressed, but she opens the door anyway. She then comes back to me, saying it's a guy she met on Facebook, someone that she hasn't seen for a year and a half, but that we have to say we're going to my grandma's so we won't stay long. I'm starting to think it's a bit weird, but we hear knocking. So my mom opens the door while I stay in my chair, overlooking the entrance. I see a rather tall man coming in, of normal build, bald, with small glasses. As soon as he entered the apartment, I felt the atmosphere change. Something oppressive was squeezing my chest. He kisses my mother and turns his head towards the living room where I am. Then he frowns when he sees me, as if he was surprised to find me here. I didn't like it. His gaze is empty, disturbing. He says hello to me from afar and walks into the living room, grabs a chair and sits down. My mother then asks him what he's doing here and why he arrived without calling first. Her answer froze my blood. I'm sorry I didn't take my phone. Actually, I'm coming from the hospital next door. I escaped. And since you told me you lived around here, I decided to stop by and say hello. At first I thought he was joking, especially since he had said it with a big smile, but his eyes were really weird, and his attitude too. My mother laughed nervously and asked him if he was serious, to which he replied that he was. He even gave us the name of the town he came from and told us how we ran away. He tells us that he was outside with three doctors on a terrace, that the doctors came in before him, while telling him to follow them. He took that opportunity to leave, passing over a hedge that overlooks a road where there's a bus stop. He got on the first passing bus and found himself not far from our house. He didn't know our exact address, but thanks to my mother, who gives her real name on social media, he knew her last name and searched all the interphones in the neighborhood before finding out where we were. While he was telling us this story, I went on Google Maps to check where he said he was coming from, and everything matched. The hedge overlooking the road, 
the back terrace, the bus stop, but most of all, it's not just any hospital he escaped from, it's a psychiatric hospital. So I started to get really scared, for myself, but especially for my mother. We have an escapee from a mental hospital in our house. He then explains to my mother that if she hasn't heard from him in over a year, it's because he came back there a year and a half ago after he lost his wife and all of his money, but he didn't linger on it for very long. It was too much for me, so I got up and said I had to go to my room. I went in. The door wasn't closing, but I took my phone and I called my best friend, who is a security guard and lives 20 minutes away by car. I tell him what's going on, and he decides to come over, armed with a knife, just in case. When I hang up the phone and go out of my room, I see the man in the corridor near the door. He tells us that he's going to have to leave because people are probably looking for him, that he has to go to a friend's house, but that he has to take the train. We say goodbye to him and he leaves, but that's not all. I then explain to my mother what just happened, that she was crazy to have given her name and address, even approximate, to a stranger on the internet. And then she tells me that last year she was at his house with my father, that his wife was there and they had a great time, so she did not consider him dangerous. I still tell her that someone you've only seen once is not someone you can trust. My buddy arrives then, sooner than expected. We decide to call the hospital to make sure what he said is true, and also to warn them that someone is missing from their house. We call. We run into the secretary and we explain our situation. She seems surprised and puts us on hold to check it out. When she comes back, she tells us that he's not in his room anymore, that all of his stuff is there, and that they hadn't noticed he was gone. It had been more than two hours since he had escaped, but since the guards had seen his belongings when they passed by the door, they hadn't worried. She however warned us that he's a dangerous psychotic, who had a crisis after his wife left him, that he can be extremely violent if he's upset. At that moment, I only think one thing. What would have happened if I hadn't been there with my mother, if she had been alone with that guy? She told us that they were going to do whatever was necessary. We asked her if we could be kept informed when they found him, but she told us she had no right to give us that kind of information. We then raise our voices and explain that we shouldn't be afraid of him coming back every day. She apologizes but can't do anything about it. We hang up the phone and decide with my friend to go and do a walk around the neighborhood for several hours and the next few days to see if he's still there but we never saw him again. All this story, which really happened, has a great moral. Never give your address to strangers, and never reveal personal information on social networks. This happened a couple of years ago, I've always wanted to have my own apartment, so when I found a one-bedroom place in an old house with its own private entrance on the side of the building, I thought I had found the perfect place. For a little background, the side door had a small deck of about 4x4, four four, with a couple of stairs that lead down to the gravel parking lot, where all the building tenants parked. I was leaving one day to go study, and when I walked out the door, I immediately noticed a man in the parking lot. At first, I thought nothing of it. I went to lock my janky front door, and when I turned around, this man was standing at the bottom of my deck stairs, staring at me. He was probably just ten feet from me, and everything about his posture made me think he was about to walk up the stairs. I had never seen him before, and he had a disturbingly dead look in his eyes. It was so unsettling. I unlocked my door and immediately went back inside. I looked out the window about five minutes later, and he wasn't there anymore, so I left and went to campus to work. I had convinced myself that I was overreacting to some stranger wandering through the parking lot, but I still messaged my best friend about the incident. She freaked out and told me it was weird. She insisted I stayed with her for the night. I brushed her off 
because I will always choose to sleep in my own bed over a sleepover. I went home after a couple of hours of study and did a lap in the parking lot in my car just to make sure no one was loitering there. I didn't see anyone. It was dark out by this time. Flash forward to an hour later, my friend was insistent that I come stay with her. She messaged and called, and eventually I gave in to go to her place. Before I left my apartment, I decided to turn on the light above my decking, something I had never done before. I walked onto my deck, locked the door, got down the stairs, and that's when I saw him. He was hiding behind a bush on the edge of the parking lot, staring at me. I only knew it was the same guy because I turned my deck light on and I could see him as clearly as I did when it was light out earlier in the day. I ran to my car and locked myself in. I skidded out on the gravel, trying to get to the main road. When I got to this road, I saw him running in the opposite direction that I was driving. I called the police, and then my friend to let them know what happened. The police called me back after searching the area. They told me that they didn't want to disturb me. But incidents like this have been happening in the area. Any information I have about what he looked like would be helpful. I'm a college student, and I was living in a cluster of college apartments where anyone who looks over the age of 30 would seem out of place. This man looked well into his 30s or 40s. The apartment building has maybe 10 residence tops, so I would have seen him in the parking lot before this if he lived there. Within the week, the dead streetlight in the parking lot was fixed, with what I can only describe to be football field floodlights. I still found a new place to live, and when trying to get out of my lease with the rental agency, I told them that fixing the lights were not enough to make me feel safe. They continued to tell me that in fact, they hadn't been the ones to fix the lights. They were upset too because neighboring tenants were complaining about how bright they were. This means that the police went to the city, and despite slow-moving bureaucracy, still got them fixed within a week. I'm so thankful to my friend who insisted I should take it seriously, and to the law enforcement who took it seriously, and decided to do something about it. I always wonder how close I was to getting murdered that day. My ex-boyfriend and I used to be co-workers. Every day after work, we'd go to this empty parking lot 15 minutes away from work to have a smoke before he dropped me off home. We were pretty young, so we didn't really have a lot of other places to hang out. We were standing outside and leaning on the driver's side of the car. It was pretty dark out and the plaza lights sort of faded away so you couldn't see beyond a certain point. We started to get lost in our conversation and weren't paying attention to our surroundings. We came here every day and nothing unusual happened in the past. As we're talking, we notice a guy come out of the door. He was walking or jogging pretty fast. Before we even had a chance to react, he was already pretty close to us. He was dressed in oversized clothes and had a backpack. We'll call him X. Everyone was silent at first. My ex and I were frozen and were already thinking of a plan to escape in case anything happened. We didn't want to make any sudden movements. But my ex secretly slipped me the keys to his car, assuming that he wanted me to casually walk to the passenger's side and get in the driver's seat so we can leave ASAP. As soon as I tried to move, X said, Please stay where you are. He seemed emotional. He seemed frantic. He was a mix between anxious, impulsive, and confident. He asked, Can I borrow one of your phones? My ex and I both said we don't have our phones. I said I hadn't paid my bill, so mine isn't functional. He said, while almost tearing up, You expect me to believe both of you don't have a phone. This is the type of shit I'm talking about. I hate being lied to. Then he really started breaking down. He said, Man, I just did the most fucked up thing. You don't know what I've just been through. We honestly thought he was on drugs. He started crying and said, I just had to kill my own best friend, my brother. And then said, 
I'm going to ask you again. Do you have a phone? I said I had a phone, but it's not working. Which was the truth, because I paid my bill late. He said to us, Don't make me have to do this to you. I really don't want to. Then he reaches for his backpack. That's when both my ex and I realized that this might be our last day on Earth. But ex said one thing that sparked something in my ex. He said, I'm a fucked up person. God's never gonna forgive me. My ex wasn't religious, but he came from a Catholic family. He started talking and calming the man down. It was almost like a hostage negotiation. My ex said to him, Remember God, man. You can always repent and be forgiven. God will forgive you. The man started to cry and dropped to his knees and dropped his back. I ran to the passenger side got in the driver's seat, reversed and flung the passenger door open for my ex. We drove off so fast. On the way home, we were shaken in disbelief. I called the police and explained the situation. The police caught up to us and asked us his description. They said they just received a call about someone with a similar description, but didn't tell us the reason. To this day, I'm not sure if he was telling the truth if he was on drugs, or what was in his bag. My life definitely flashed for a moment. We searched the news every day for a month for a similar incident, and we did find one about a man shot and injured in that area on the exact same date as the incident. We can never be sure, and I never really want to find out. So this happened to me about 13 years ago. I was 10 at the time and my brother was 8. We just moved to a new town that year and the Walmart here had this sweet arcade up near the service desk. So every time my parents would bring us grocery shopping, they'd give us each a few dollars and let us play in the arcade. The town had an incredibly low crime rate and the arcade is at the front of the store where dozens of people are checking out. What could possibly go wrong? My brother is playing the claw machine while I'm standing on the side of the machine, trying to help him angle the claw perfectly above a stuffed animal he's trying to get. Suddenly, this random hillbilly walks up to the claw machine next to us, inserts a quarter, and begins moving the claw around. But for most of this time, he's making eye contact with my brother and smiling, not even watching the game. He's not talking to us, just staring and smiling. He has long, thin brown and silver hair, pulled back into a loose ponytail at the base of his skull, a camo trucker hat and a long scraggly beard. I remember vividly the way he smiled, stale beer, ashtray, and something that smelled like a sweet yet sour dirt or fungus. He tried making small talk with my brother and I, who were raised to be aware of strangers, but still to be polite. Eventually we got bored of the game we were playing, and I usher my brother to follow me to a new game, on the opposite side of the arcade. A few seconds later, the man follows us, stationing himself, once again, at the claw machine next to us. At some point, an overweight lady walks in and says to the hillbilly, What are you doing to these little kids? And snickers at me. He replies, I'm trying to win them some stuffed animals. She then begins to play the claw machine on the other side of us, so that my brother and I are sandwiched between these two strange hillbillies. This comment comes across as weird to me, because previously I thought he was maybe trying to win something for his kids. But this entire time, he'd just been following my brother and I from game to game, trying to win us toys. This has been going on for maybe 20 minutes at this point, they followed us to several different machines and spent a lot of money. Each time my brother and I switched machines, they'd follow us. The hillbilly says to the lady, I'm out of money, you got any? She says, nah, I'm broke too. My brother says, I still have a dollar. Now this is the part that really scared me. I remember listening to these two talk about some weird things with us asking if I have a boyfriend, 
asking where we go to school, where our parents work, asking if we've ever done drugs, all that weird stuff. But when my brother said he had a dollar, she responded with the most terrifying thing I've heard from them yet. The woman suddenly bursts out. Well, shit. Then give it to him, boy. Her face was red. The tone in which she shouted was so ear-piercing and gut-wrenching that I could feel the blood drain from my face. My brother looked like he was about to cry. He hands her the dollar and her face lights up. She laughs it off, almost like she was trying to make it seem like she was joking when she yelled at us. My father walks up a couple of minutes later. As I turn to tell him that these people have spent close to $15 to win toys for us, they leave hurriedly before he gets a good look at them. My dad is livid. He takes up to the front desk and tells them what I told him. They make an announcement on the intercom to keep an eye out for these people, to report them to an employee if they see them. They eventually call the police. I don't actually remember this part, or much of anything after my father arrives. But this is what he told me. They never did find the couple. The police reviewed the security cameras and told my parents that the couple left the store immediately after my father showed up, without any groceries. Every time I see a man or a woman in Walmart, that looks as I remember them. I get anxiety and try to avoid them. It's been long enough that I'm ready to tell this story. Last year, I was dog-sitting for my aunt. The dog is small, sweet, and a little skittish. I had to work for most of the week, and I was just living in the house for the time being. It's a nice house. Not big enough to feel empty if you're alone, but not small enough to feel cramped. The only rooms I used were the kitchen, bathroom, living room, and the guest bedroom. My last day of work this particular week was a double shift. I was excited because after this I had two days off. I planned on using them to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I usually try to keep good spirits for a double shift because regardless of the time and annoying customers, extra money is always needed. My old job was a barista and cashier. Mornings are always busy and nights are slow. On weekends, People are more concerned with coffee and breakfast than anything else we may have to offer. I was having a nice time, actually, because this day was turning out to be not as hectic as the previous ones that week. As the morning rush line was dwindling, the limited tables in the restaurant came into view, and I started people watching. As I slowly scanned the customers eating bagels and reading the paper, my eyes met a man at a laptop. He had long, dirty hair with a bit of stubble. He stared at me with a bit too much intensity. I wondered if he found my people watching rude, so I decided to clean and restock instead. It didn't take long for a line to reform, so I returned to my register. Once again, after the line died down, I could see the few tables in the front. The man was still there, and he was still staring at me. Every now and then, he would look at his computer, and then back to me. It almost felt like he was looking right through me, or like he could see every part of me. It felt so uncomfortable that I went and cleaned in the back of the restaurant, out of his sight. After the next rush, I took my break. I sat far away from the man. He was out of my sight, and I was out of his. When I came back from my break, the man was gone. My manager had asked if I had interacted with him at all. I told her about him making eye contact with me, but that nothing else really happened. She told me that the man had been watching some pretty explicit stuff on his laptop. She had asked him to leave, so that was weird enough. This man had been watching stuff and staring at me. I really wish that was where the story stopped. Hours pass, and the rest of the day was entirely normal despite me and a few female co-workers feeling a slight edge. We were in the process of closing, which is actually a process I really enjoy. We're well in, and I'm almost done with my assigned jobs. 
when my manager comes up to me again. She informs me that the man had found his way back into the restaurant at some point. She found him hiding in a back corner. She chased him out by threatening to call the police. She knew that earlier in the day, he seemed to be paying attention to me. She said I could finish up whatever I wanted or needed to. But afterwards, she strongly advised me to get home as soon as possible. She also offered to walk me to my car. I took both offers and quickly got my things together and clocked out. My aunt's house was not far from work. It was a five minute drive at most, which was helpful because then I didn't feel crippling anxiety for much longer. I got in the house and after triple checking that I had locked every door, I got into my pajamas. But unsurprisingly, I was not ready to sleep yet. Now was the time to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I went into the living room. The living room consists of a couch, two chairs, a TV, a window, and the front door. Unfortunately, the porch light was broken and the window had no curtains. That had me a little stressed out, but I was willing to take that over the only other TV in the house, which was the one that exists in the scary basement. Facing the basement TV included having my back to a sliding glass door facing the very dark woods. No thanks. I was setting up the TV when the dog started growling. I really didn't think much of it. As I said, the dog is skittish, so he growls and barks all the time. I wasn't looking at him. I was muttering, shush, shush, and figuring out how to work the TV. The dog didn't stop and started to get louder, so I finally put down the remote and turned to face the dog. I froze. The dog was barking at the window, and there was an outline of a man at the window. The exact same build as the one at the restaurant. I screamed, and luckily that was enough for the man to run away from the window. I stood there, frozen for a while. The dog had calmed down, but I hardly felt safe. So I went into the kitchen, grabbed a big knife, and did what any responsible adult would do. I called my mommy. She did not advise calling the police, and instead came and spent the night with me. I told my aunt. I spent the rest of my time dog-sitting, clutching the knife any time I slept or took a shower. My aunt also gave me permission to have one friend stay with me every night. Nothing else ever happened. I never even saw the guy come into work again. A part of me wishes I knew who he was or where he went, or what he even wanted with me. I am glad he was a coward, and that all it took to scare him off was my scream and an extra small dog. So when I was 13, my friend Mary had a grandma who ran a nail salon downtown. I grew up in a really, really small town in Alaska. When I was younger, it seemed like a really safe place. As I got older, I realized just how corrupt and horrible it actually was. But at 13, I still wasn't totally aware of that. After school, Mary and I would always walk to her grandma's nail salon. It was in a building with a few other shops. We would kind of just hang out there and browse. It was a Thai restaurant that was our favorite ever. We'd eat there a lot too and were pretty good friends with the restaurant owners. After some months of the same routine, just hanging out every day caused me and Mary's family to become like family. Her grandmother, Gretchen, had the idea of wanting to open a little coffee shop stand in there. The other shops were a cookware store, a clothes consignment shop, a game shop, and a couple of the random ones, so we figured it would have been a nice business. She wanted Mary and I to work the coffee stand while she was in the nail salon. I partly believe it was that she just simply wanted us out of her hair. Anyway, we went and trained properly, but since we were 13, we were being paid under the counter. We had set it up right in front of the Thai restaurant. After about a week of the coffee stand of being up and running, this guy started visiting, who looked to be about 18 to 20 years old. He would get a small vanilla latte every day, 
and sit in the mall and kind of watch us work. He would also browse around the game shop, so we just kind of thought that maybe he lived nearby and liked to come there every day. Maybe we hadn't noticed him because he obviously wouldn't be coming in to get his nails done. He honestly looked kind of dirty and like he didn't care that much. When the months got hotter, we started walking home instead of her mom driving us. There were a lot of kids walking around, so I didn't notice very much if people were behind or in front of me. One of the nights, we closed up shop a little late. It was about 9pm, which in Alaska is still fully sunny, and I noticed that someone was walking behind me kind of close. I stopped dead in my tracks and didn't hear anything, so I kept walking, and then I was sure I heard it again. I turned around, and there he was. The same guy that was in the mall every day, following me. I was 13 and shy, so I just kept walking and made a loop around. I walked to the mayor's office because the police station was too far. I called my dad from there because I felt safe. He came and got me. This repeated in slightly different ways for about two weeks, and eventually, to this day, I don't know how, he found out where I lived. He would knock on the door, leave flowers, call our home phone, all kinds of crazy stuff. My dad finally helped me get a restraining order, but it took about a month to get anyone to take us seriously and come see him at my workplace as we had no idea what his name was. Once that was in effect, it stopped for only about a week, and he started showing up again. He continued stalking my home, and even hanging out by the fence of my school when school was back in session. Finally, I had had enough. I had moved in with my mom because she was, frankly, a better parent to me and taking it way more seriously. She lived so far out that I couldn't walk anywhere. She had no electricity or running water, but I didn't care anymore. I felt so much safer and so much more loved. I quit that job. I took the bus every day. Eventually, he just disappeared, and I never heard about him ever again. So for a bit of background, I'm a female, and at the time, I was 20. I moved in with my uncle in San Antonio, Texas, with the agreement that I didn't have to pay rent as long as I helped him out with chores and my cousins. I got a job at a super known coffee chain downtown, close to the touristy part of the area. We had a lot of regulars and a lot of homeless people coming in and out. I felt relatively safe though, because I got to know people there, and it was almost always a lot of foot traffic. I used to even take walks after work in the area especially since I was super close to the river walk. Skip to a couple of months into the job, I was friends with everyone I worked with. We were all pretty close. On this particular day, it was one of my co-workers' last days. There were about three guys who had been in there almost all morning. They hadn't bought anything and were just hanging out, which was not unusual for my location. On my break, I decided to walk to a nearby drugstore so I can get a few farewell cards and maybe a small gift for said co-worker. I walked out and put my earphones in, and before I could even press play, I hear the door open behind me, and footsteps following behind. Whoever it was caught up to me, and started walking beside me, matching my pace exactly. I turned to look, and it was one of the guys that had been there all morning. He was a bit taller than me, and reminded me a lot of Lakeith Stanfield, he tried to ask for my number, and I kindly told him no. He persisted, and I, with a short temper, told him to fuck off. He stopped and stared at me in surprise, as I don't look like someone who speaks up or is rude. He stood there as I walked away, and by the time I went back, they were all gone. I proceeded to tell my co-workers about the encounter, and we laughed it off. I thought that would be the end of it. I was wrong. Every shift after that, he would already be there just hanging out, or would walk in mid-shift, sometimes with somebody else and sometimes by himself. 
I assumed he was just another homeless person, because how else was he always able to be around? My shifts were sporadic. Sometimes I opened, some days I closed, some days I worked the mid. But it didn't matter, he was always there. At that point, I started feeling paranoid. I would always catch him staring in my direction. He never ordered anything, never talked to me, and luckily wouldn't follow me. He would just sit there, watching me. I started mentioning it to my co-workers, and they started noticing it too. One of my team leaders would help me out by sending me to clean the dishes in the back, or even organize the cooler. My co-workers would also try and place themselves to try to block me from his view. I started feeling uncomfortable at work. Sometimes when I closed, a co-worker would walk me to my car before heading home themselves. Or if I didn't close, they would walk me to my car and turn around and head back to work. Then one day of him just staring, I was working at the register that day. He walked up and ordered a water. I asked for his name for his order. I now had his first name just in case. He took his water and sat down. I had mentioned him before to my manager, but because he hadn't really done anything, we couldn't do anything besides note it in the manager book. The next day, I worked with my manager. It was him, two other co-workers, and me. I told them I had to go to the bathroom real quick. There were two bathrooms right next to each other, but sort of hidden from the coffee bar and register, and they weren't gender-specific. I walked around the bar to the lobby area. I had to pass by his table and walk down the lobby to get to the bathrooms. I noticed him get up before going inside the bathroom. I sat down to do my business when someone rattled the knob. I shouted out that it was occupied but whoever it was kept rattling the door until I finished. When I opened the door, no one was there. Walking back, I noticed him adjusting back into his chair. I was really freaked out and told my boss. He couldn't tell him anything because we had no proof that it was him. Later that shift, he got up and picked up a coffee from the pickup area. My boss assumed he had ordered it and let him take it. I told him it wasn't, and that wasn't even his name. My boss used this as an opportunity to tell him, if he does something like that again, he can't come back. The man apologized and actually stuck to the rules every day after that. He went back to just watching me. And now cut to Valentine's Day. One of my team leaders and I would schedule to work certain Thursdays after close to deep clean the store. We would stay until 1am. This was one of those Thursdays. We were almost done and I had to clean the bathrooms as one of the last chores. I finished and as I walk out of the bathroom, I see him peeking in with both hands pressed to the window, eyes wide just staring at me with his really intense look. I froze for a second just staring back. I notice on one of his palms that is pressed to the window a purple foam heart. He doesn't move at all. I freak out and run back into the bathroom. I shout, Hannah, Hannah, he's here, he's back. She barely hears me through the music we were blasting. Hannah was the team lead who would help me hide from him so she knew the huge fear I had towards him. She walks towards the bathroom, shouting back, What are you saying? What's going on? As soon as she gets close, she sees him. I told her again, He's here. He's watching me. She started shouting through the window. You need to leave. If you don't, we're calling the police. I step out a bit to see if he'll leave. He's ignoring her. His eyes were fixated in my direction. I step back into the bathroom and my lead continues to shout at him. She tells him to leave again and threatens him with the police. About five minutes pass, and he realizes that I'm not stepping out until he leaves. So he does. The next day, my lead and I told my manager I want to file a police report. He tells me no, to wait until he talks to his boss. He shows up again that day, but I was only there to talk to my manager and leave right after. When I got home, a friend convinced me to call the cops. So I messaged my boss that I don't care what he or his boss says. I'm scared 
and I'm going to file that report. I dial 911 and tell them a summarized version. They tell me that they're going to send someone to where I live to take an official report. The officers were so nice and supportive. I told them my whole story and how my boss didn't feel the need to get the cops involved since I wasn't harmed. The officers told me that I should have called right away and defend me, saying they can get him for harassment. I thank them and they tell me if he shows up again to dial 911 so they can take him in for trespassing and harassing. I think that day my manager banned him and warned him because he never showed up to the coffee shop again. A few months later, when I was comfortable again with downtown, I went out with some friends to walk around. We were close to where I worked, and as we round a corner, I see him. So I ducked into a little corner store and my friends follow. I told them I saw him, and they kept an eye out. Once he was out of view, we left the store. That was the last time I saw him. I will share an incident that happened to me last October. It was 10 a.m. on a weekday. I had the day off, so I decided to go to the grocery store and get some pumpkins to carve. I did my shopping without any problems. Didn't notice anything was off since it was earlier in the day and the other shoppers were elderly. I bought three large pumpkins and had them in a cart to put them in the trunk of my car. As I was putting the first pumpkin in my trunk, I feel someone pulling the pumpkin out of my arm backwards. I spun around and threw the pumpkin in the process to see two men directly behind me. I am a very small woman, so I immediately felt endangered. The one man who I assumed was the man who first grabbed at me made an attempt to scream at me in a language. I didn't understand and he grabbed at me again. I pushed the cart with the remaining pumpkins at the two men got in my car to lock the doors and drove away. The two men got into a white, brand new Dodge Charger that had templates and sped out of the parking lot after me. The street we both pulled out on was a busy, four-lane, 25-mile-per-hour business district. You can't safely speed. That didn't matter to the Dodge Charger, who weaved in and out of traffic to try and run me off the road. The driving was so erratic that another driver attempted to box the charger in. It didn't matter much. They went into oncoming traffic anyway. Meanwhile, I threw my left turn signal on and made a quick right into a coffee and donut chain I regularly frequent. Next to this coffee chain is a pizza chain. I noticed the charger had pulled into this pizza chain and was waiting for me to pull out of the coffee chain parking lot. I frantically told the employee what was going on through the drive through while I ordered a snack. I was there and didn't want to have to pull out yet. This coffee chain knows me well, and on this day, the manager went above and beyond the call of duty. She called the police who told her to have me pull around to the window. She did, knowing I would be in full view of the charger. So she came outside to stand between us with the biggest rolling pin I've ever seen in my life. She stared those men down like my own mother would have. The cops came and took statements. The charger was still there and searched. One officer told me they pulled tarp and a rope from the trunk and that they were treating this as a trafficking attempt. Both men refused to answer any questions and were arrested. I don't know for sure what their intent was, but I live in a sanctuary city with mostly people from Nepal or Bhutan. I've never had a scary issue. I love my neighborhood, but I did not recognize these men or their car frequenting the neighborhood. That day I bought everyone working at the coffee chain a gift certificate for a massage as a thank you for protecting me, and I still tip them every morning extra, a year later. This took place about eight years ago. I had been single for a very long time. My kids kept telling me to get back into the swing of things, but I just kept making excuses. My nephew told me about this dating site. He said there was no harm in talking to people, so I did. I put everything out there. There were no surprises when or if they met me. I thought that if they still contacted me after reading all I had described myself, 
and we matched. Then maybe I would have coffee with them. Well, I matched with a few, and the conversations went well. I met with one gentleman who was way too regimental for my crazy life, and kindly declined any more involvement with him. Another guy seemed too pushy, and acted like I should be honored to be in his presence. But then there came Richard. Now please keep in mind, I had very low self-esteem at the time. That being said, Richard seemed great. We carried on conversations for hours. He lived an hour and a half away, so all we could really do was talk to each other. We talked about our kids, dreams, goals. My daughter even friended one of his sons on Facebook. I was a secretary for some self-help meetings in my town, and he was going to school to be a counselor. Perfect, right? We talked for at least four months, but after a while, I noticed that he kept having small problems come up. Arguments with his mom, with whom he was living. No money for gas. His truck broke down. His oldest boy was mad at him. Just little things, you know. Not anything that would set me off. But it was his poor me to hell with it attitude. I tried to let that go. And really be a positive influence in his life. His mother and boys loved me. They told me that they had never seen him so happy. Time went on and we were still talking every day. I had an opportunity to come see him. And of course, my daughter went with me so she could meet his son in person as well. I took him and his son out to eat at the only little coffee shop in that town. He knew I was on a fixed income, but I paid anyway because he was going to school and didn't have an income as of yet. We had a great time. We met at his son's house on a hilltop town. We were having such a good time that we didn't notice that the snow was coming down hard and the roads were icing up. So my daughter and I stayed the night in one of the rooms. It seemed like the closer we got to his family, the more distant they became to him. It was odd. The next day, the roads were clear, so we said our goodbyes and went home. But before we left, I received one extra hug from his son's mother-in-law. She whispered into my ear, do not fall for him. I thought that maybe there was something she didn't like about me. That came out of left field. The next few days we didn't talk. I thought that was odd. Did I do something wrong? Someone from the self-help meeting told me that there was a man looking for me. She said he looked disheveled and smelled like alcohol. This wasn't a surprise to me because I had helped quite a few people get back on their feet. Maybe this one fell off the wagon and just needed to talk. As I was driving down my street, I saw a truck in my driveway I didn't recognize at first. It was him. He found out where I lived and was sitting in front of my house. At first I was happy until I looked in his truck and saw him slumped over, reeking of booze. At that point, my fix mode set in and I asked him in for some strong coffee. He told me that he had a blowout with his mother. She had kicked him out and his boys won't talk to him. I got him some clean clothes and told him to take a shower. I figured we could sort it out the next day. In the meantime, I was taking him to a meeting. He sobered up and agreed to go, but the whole time at the meeting, my friends were acting like I had lost my mind. Did they see something I was blind to? We went back to my house and he seemed okay, almost too okay, like nothing at all had happened. My son pulled me aside and told me he didn't like him much, but I thought that maybe he was just being overprotective. I should have paid more attention. We went to the store because I wasn't prepared for the extra mouth. I bought four liters of soda, a gallon of milk, two monsters for both him and my son, some chips and other things for dinner. After we ate, we all watched some TV and headed off to bed. I let him sleep on the spare bed in my room, but in the middle of the night, he tried to get frisky. At that point, no. My grown kids were in the other room, and something just didn't sit well with me. It was like he wasn't the same man he was before. The next morning, my daughter came out of the bathroom angry. She said in a loud voice, Someone pissed all over the toilet. He didn't say a word. Later we were all eating breakfast, 
and he started to let food drop out of his mouth onto the table and floor, and was spitting food while he was talking. He took three two liters and drank them back to back, letting some run down his chin. What the hell? Then, yes, there is more. He took the remote and started setting future recordings for his favorite shows, and even deleting a few of my grandchildren's. He set recordings for weeks in advance. Wait, wait, wait. What are you doing, my friend? This is not cool. I told him, but he acted like I said nothing. Then he went to the refrigerator and told me that I had to go to the store to buy more soda and stuff because it was all gone. I mean, it was all gone. He even drank my son's monster and the whole gallon of milk all in one day. At this point, my daughter was also livid, so she contacted his son. He proceeded to tell her that Richard's mother kicked him out because he wouldn't get a job and was stealing money and eating her out of house and home. His other son wouldn't talk to him because he keeps asking for money and won't pay it back. He himself was mad at him for lying to me by telling me he was going to school when he wasn't and using me as his next big meal ticket. Well, that was it. I got all of his stuff together and took it to his truck. I asked him to leave. It doesn't end there. He had loosened some bolts on his transmission, making it impossible to move. He begged and pleaded for me to let him stay. At this point, snot was coming out of his nose. Good God. He said that he just wanted to be close to me, and if that meant sleeping in his truck, he would do that, and he could not live without me. No. I called his oldest son and told them, that if they didn't come with a tow truck and get their dad, his fate was not going to be nice. They arrived two hours later, apologizing for their father's actions. We found out through his son that for many years, he had gone through quite a few unhealthy relationships. He took advantage of a lot of women that fell for his lies. He still tries to find me on Facebook to this day. So I work overnight shift at a hotel. We get some weirdos every now and then, but it's usually nothing more than the typical drunk asshats coming from a nearby club, looking to see if we have any available rooms. Last week though, at around 1am, this very normal looking woman comes in. She takes a long while in the lobby before coming to the desk to check in. I look up her reservation and try to run her card, but he keeps declining. She responds by saying to just check her in anyway. She'll figure it out later. Obviously, I can't do that, to which she tells me to get the manager. I get the manager, who explains the same thing. This lady switches up her entire demeanor instantly and starts acting fucking crazy. What follows was honestly more comical to me than creepy, but she starts speaking in third person, claiming that her vessel is being used by a demon, and that if we didn't treat her with more respect, she'd curse our entire lives. My manager says something along the lines of, cool, but we still need a credit card. And then this woman starts mixing up all types of lore and terminologies from popular witch media, calling us muggles, listing off specific curses she'd be putting on us, and that'd be a thousand years minimum. She also kept saying she used to work for Teen Vogue magazine, Anyway, eventually security came to escort her out of the building, but the whole thing was weird as hell. It cracks me up, but it also creeps me out. Three or four days ago, my wife and I were sound asleep in our bedroom. Around 2.45 a.m., our German Shepherd Duke started barking viciously. We've never heard him bark like this before, so we assumed something was amiss. I got up to check and see if something was up, and ended up spilling water on my nightstand. It took me two to three minutes to clean up the water, and I figured maybe Duke was simply barking at the rain. I went back to sleep. 
A few minutes later, Duke starts again with the vicious bark. My wife starts freaking out and turns our lamp on. We sat in bed for a second, spooked, and then we heard someone trying our front door. We heard the screen door clicking into place after being shut. The front door was locked, so he had no way to get in. At this point I'm freaked out, and so is my wife. From our bedroom, we can see a window in our kitchen that leads out front. My wife starts staring at it intensely and tells me she can see a shadow moving back and forth. She said it was a dark silhouette walking up and down our front sidewalk. At this point I'm getting scared, and when I get scared, I get angry. I get up and turn on our kitchen lights, in hopes of spooking the stranger outside. You would think he would leave with our dog barking and our lights turned on. I made a stupid mistake. I went to the garage and opened the garage door. I then realized I wasn't wearing shoes and went back to my living room to put them on. I wanted to go outside, find the disturbance and deal with it. Duke was with me the whole time, and when he suddenly turned and started running towards the door that connects to the garage, I knew I had fucked up. I turned and looked, and this guy was just standing in my kitchen with mud on his face. He smelled like shit. He was wearing relatively decent clothes and didn't appear to be homeless. As I started approaching him, it looked like he was getting ready to take his jacket and shoes off. It was very bizarre. I yelled at him, get the fuck out of my house, while Duke was jumping, growling and barking at the guy. He took a step back and said something incomprehensible. I yelled, it's three in the morning, get the fuck out of my house, and I shoved him. He sort of stumbled and made his way out of the house into the garage, and then left. I shut the garage door and called the cops. The cops came and said there were a couple of drug addicts in the area known to do things like this, except they didn't fit the description of the guy I described. I haven't been able to sleep for a few days now. I don't know what this guy was after. Best case scenario, he was incredibly fucked up and had no idea what he was doing. Maybe he thought it was his house since he started taking his shoes and jacket off. From the front door leading from the garage and into the house, there is a glass. Where I was standing he couldn't see me, but he could see my wife. It is possible he saw her alone and thought maybe she was by herself. The guy wasn't aggressive towards me, but he was bigger than me. Roughly six foot two and 210 pounds. Before you all say it, I know I shouldn't have opened the garage. He obviously took it as an open invitation, and I felt guilty about it since it's happened. I figured barking dogs, lights on, garage opening, a normal burglar would just scram. My wife and I are incredibly lucky he wasn't armed, or didn't do anything violent towards us. I just can't understand how anyone in their right mind would act the way he did. I was driving home late one night. There were virtually no cars on the road. Eventually I noticed a cop car had zoomed up close behind me, as if to pull me over. Only something was off. I couldn't tell how long it had actually been behind me, because there was no siren and none of the lights were on. Not the little police laptop, not even the headlights. In any event, realizing a cop was riding my tail, I pulled over. I was an 18-year-old black kid who had just moved in from the inner city, so my instinct was to comply. But looking back, I definitely should have kept driving. Anyway, sure enough, the patrol car pulled over behind me, but whoever was in the patrol car did not get out, did not turn on the lights or the siren either. The only illumination was a few of those sickly yellow halogen street lamps a block away or so. And with no passing cars, I couldn't see into the patrol car. All I could see was a hardly discernible silhouette in the driver's seat. I sat there for a while. I don't remember how long, but it had to have been around five minutes of near total silence. I remember just being puzzled at first, 
I think I even said, what the fuck, under my breath a few times. But I just sat there, staring into the dark patrol car through my rear view. And then my brain began to turn over. There was a creeping feeling that I was in danger. It clicked that I was either being pranked, or I was about to be subject to something much worse. Finally, I calmly started my engine and pulled away, and the patrol car did not follow. To give you a little background, I have a tick where I laugh at the most awkward and inappropriate moments. I've always said that I would probably laugh even if someone is causing me physical harm. Now on to the story. My family and I owned a small business in a not so great part of town. One day I was just eating my sandwich and watching The Young and Restless as I did every day with a co-worker. We were the only two there at the time. I looked up and saw a figure peering through our display window, but I just assumed they were checking out the awesome display my mom put in there, because sometimes people only came in to see what creative display she had come up with that season. They suddenly opened the door and shut it, and I thought, huh, that's odd. So I stand up to see what's going on. That's when I see a tall figure with a full face bandana mask on, with only the eyes and mouth cut out. He comes through the door and demands us to give him the money. Naturally, I freak out, but I've always been told just to give them what they want and don't protest. And that's what I planned on doing. Next thing I know, my co-worker stands up and says run as she's running towards the back. So I was like, uh, okay, and I ran too. I went through the back door, assuming she was right behind me. I get all the way to the back of the driveway and I turn around and see she's not there. I start panicking. Where is she? I'm just standing there like a dumbass, because I honestly don't even know what to do at this point. I'm still trying to process what the hell just happened. I start walking down the bank on the road beside us to tell them to call the cops, since I left my cell phone behind. Then I hear a deep-voiced man say, Take me to the money, in a hateful tone. I turn around and there's this man pointing a gun at me, so I just say okay and go with him. I then start laughing like some kind of crazy person and he gets agitated. He yells at me to walk faster and pointed the gun at my back. I tell him I'm sorry, so I give him the whole $50 that we had in our register. He takes me to the back and tells me to stand there and count to 20. So I do what he says and then yell for my co-worker trying to figure out where the hell she went. Did they have her or what? Don't worry though, she was safe hiding in the bathroom. And I can say, after everything that happened, the cops never found out who did it. This took place around 2015. I was 25 and my ex was 26. I lived in an apartment that was basically a house split up into three apartments. We had the whole top floor. The downstairs consisted of a medium-sized apartment and a small studio-sized apartment. It wasn't a great neighborhood, but I grew up in the area on and off over the years, so I felt fairly comfortable. Anyways... The medium-sized apartment was occupied the whole time by some douche who we tried not to interact with, but the studio was empty when we moved in. Eventually, a couple of months into us living there, a guy moved into the studio. He was an older fellow in his 50s with long white hair. He presented himself with this wholesome, hippie vibe. Us, being friendly, decided to invite him up to our place one day to hang out with our friend group. We shared beers, we played music and laughed. We hung out with this person a few times because he seemed fairly harmless. It wasn't long after meeting him that the red flags started showing. At one point, he started casually talking about smoking crack and meth. After he left, my ex and I agreed that as long as he doesn't bring it around us or smoke it in front of us, that we'd mind our own business. But I also said that we shouldn't openly invite him anymore. 
Well, he got comfortable knocking on our door at random times of the night, whenever he'd hear us hanging out with people. And unfortunately, one of our friends ended up being into meth as well. They started hanging out with Jay on his own. We shared a stairwell with Jay. Eventually, I started coming home to random people hanging out in our dark stairwell, waiting for him. This is when I really started getting uncomfortable. It was no longer about minding my own business. I was assertive and would ask or state, Why are you sitting here? Do you live here? Jay isn't here. You need to leave. I'd say all of that stuff. Coming home late at night to Jay's crack buddies waiting in the dark definitely wasn't a good feeling. I didn't want to be responsible for someone getting evicted and ending up on the streets. Because I know that addiction is a hell of a thing. But I ended up telling the landlord what was going on. He just said that he would give Jay a warning that if there were any more issues then to let him know. Well, shortly thereafter, my ex comes home from work with a bewildered look on his face and says, Jay is laying in a pool of blood at the bottom of the steps. So I immediately follow him downstairs. I saw that Jay was at the bottom on the outside steps, covered in blood. He wasn't moving. We started tapping his shoulder and yelling his name. He eventually started to groan and try to stand up. I kept telling him not to move and that we were calling an ambulance. In response to this, he got freaked out and staggered to his feet. Blood pouring from a deep gash on his forehead. He keeps repeating that he's fine. We follow him into his studio, and I start dabbing his wounds with some paper towels that were on the counter. I can see how big the gash is. I keep telling him that he probably has a concussion and should not go to sleep. I ask him what happened, but he just kept mumbling that he didn't know. He eventually pushes us out and keeps repeating not to call an ambulance. Then he shuts his door. Of course I called 911. I wasn't going to be responsible for him going to sleep and never waking up. The paramedics arrive and I explain the situation, saying how he's refusing help and the extent of his injuries. They start banging on his door, demanding that he opens it. He kept yelling and refusing, but he ends up opening it. After this, we didn't see him for about a month. We didn't know if he had died or what. Eventually, one day, as I'm walking up to my apartment, I see him sitting on the outside steps, smoking a cigarette. He has stitches all along his forehead and was wearing a neck brace. I said something like, Hey, what happened that night? He explained that he had a concussion, a fractured vertebra, and a broken hip. He had to be airlifted to a hospital in the city. But for some reason, the thing he said next was the most chilling to me. He said that all he really remembered is being at the bottom of the steps, laying in his own blood. There was someone pulling his ring off his finger while saying, You won't need this where you're going. The thought of someone callously assaulting someone to the point of near death, then stealing a ring off of him and just leaving him there to die, well, it just shook me to the bone. My ex and I lived there for about a year and a half. The landlord eventually kicked Jay out soon after he arrived back from the hospital. One night, my friend Kay sent me a picture of a group of our friends hanging out. It reminded me of this encounter. Kay and I had just graduated high school and we were hanging out with our younger friends before they had to go back to school for another week. James was a year behind us, and Evelyn and Mike were a year behind him. It was just the five of us hanging out. We'd gone out for supper and were now hanging out at a local park with a playground. It was almost dark, but still light enough that you could see all the way down the street. It was muddy, so instead of sitting on the ground, my friends each sat on one of the four rocking horses, tethered into the wood chips. I was the outlier, and I sat across from them on the playground equipment, about 15 feet away. We fell into a moment of silence, and Mike and Evelyn pulled out their phones. I remember looking around, and I thought I heard a man's voice somewhere behind me. Did you hear that? I asked. All my friends were facing me but the playground equipment was blocking their view. 
so they just looked up and shrugged. A few seconds later, I heard it again. There weren't any houses for about a quarter of a mile, and I couldn't see anybody. It was really off-putting. James told me I was being paranoid, and it was probably nothing. We sat there in silence for about 30 more seconds, and then I heard a stick break right behind me. I spun around, and a man wearing all black was walking behind me. I laughed and told him, Oh jeez, you startled me. He didn't answer. I then realized that he wasn't walking past me. He was walking toward me. He picked up his speed. Who are you talking to? Mike asked. From their angle, my friends couldn't see the man. I looked back and pointed at the guy, but he had turned and was now sprinting across the lawn towards the street. Kay and Evelyn caught just a glimpse of him before he disappeared into the darkness. That guy was just here, I said. I got up and moved toward my friends. I wasn't quite sure what happened, but I had never felt so uneasy. Suddenly, a vehicle we hadn't seen on the street flipped its headlights on, blinding us and slowly rolled down the street. It stopped right in front of the playground like it was staring at us. Another person wearing all black ran to the vehicle from the opposite direction and hopped in, and the vehicle sped off. We sat there for a couple of minutes, asking ourselves, what the hell, and then we decided to leave and go home. I have no idea what the hell that guy wanted, but I'm glad I'll never find out. I was walking downtown Atlanta from my friend's apartment to an Airbnb I was staying at with friends. I was alone, but I'm 6 foot plus and 225 pounds. I walked by a couple of drunk girls and turned a corner when a van pulls up from behind on the street I just turned off of. The van was a tan GMC. No windows. A man gets out of the sliding door of the van and walks towards the now visibly concerned drunk girls. The man is maybe five foot seven and skinny. I turn around and say, What you doing there? In a commando voice type of tone. The guy jumps, turns, and hops back in the sliding door of the van, and the van peels off. I walk with the girls to their apartment, and then back to my Airbnb. It was like 3am, but the streets were lit. It was a nicer part of Atlanta, I guess Midtown. Maybe the van was a taxi, but... What taxi has a second guy hiding out in the cargo compartment? Seems like a rather dumb spot to abduct rich white girls. Lots of security cameras at the front of all apartment complexes, and not to mention doormen in some of the nicer ones. Maybe it was a dare and the guy thought I was a cop. I was sitting there, just thinking about Reddit posts I read, joking about how the gaps between public restroom doors and stalls are so wide in the US you could make eye contact with someone. When I looked up, I noticed an older woman washing her hands through the mirror reflection on the opposite side of the stalls. We could very well have made eye contact. Knowing this, I tried my best to wait it out, let her leave so I could go about my business. Finally, she left to go grab napkins, and as I reached for the toilet paper to clean myself, I noticed her on the other side of the door. This time, she was turned around, staring right at me. She waited for me to look at her, and when I did, she gave the most sickening smirk I'd ever seen. I don't care who you are. This is so sickening and should never be okay at any age. I'm a grown woman. I was in such a vulnerable place. I felt sick and still do. I can't imagine how a child would feel if it happened to them. This happened when I was in first grade. After school, I had to take the bus as we lived a bit too far for me to get dropped off and picked up each day. I would usually get dropped off by the bus on a random street, 
near a different school with a bunch of kids. My grandma would be there, waiting for me. The street couldn't be seen from that school, however, and it was basically just a random street with no real places around. There were some houses, but they were behind walls, so they couldn't see this street. It was a great place to grab someone and not be seen. One day my uncle had borrowed the car and was supposed to pick me up. I didn't know this at the time, so I was confused as to why my grandma wasn't there. Since this was back in the day when little kids didn't have cell phones, I had no way to call her and see what was going on. I was stuck there, pacing back and forth since my uncle was late. All the cars left except one, but I didn't pay much attention. Even the kids that would walk home from the bus stop were gone at this point. About ten minutes later, a car pulls up. I can still remember this car because for some reason, it had patches of cloths on it in random places, as if this person was trying to make a quilted car. The ugliness of the car doesn't matter. I just thought it was odd. Anyway, an older lady gets out of the car and starts walking towards me as I'm still pacing back and forth. I see her and stop, and then suddenly I heard a voice behind me asking that lady what she's doing. Without taking her eyes off of me, the lady said, Oh, my daughter cancelled and told me my granddaughter was pacing back and forth on this street. She wanted me to come pick her up. By this time, the voice behind me was next to me, and I saw it was my mom's friend. She put her arm around me and told the lady that I was the only one there and that I was with her. The crazy lady glared at us for a second before storming off to her car. She drove away quickly. It turns out the car that was sitting there the whole time was my friend and her mom. She was watching to make sure I got picked up. She took me to her car and had me call my grandma to ask if it was okay for her to take me home. If it hadn't been for her staying around to make sure I got picked up, I could be living a very different life right now. So thank you to her. When I lived in rural Maine, my boyfriend at the time took me on a drive in his truck. He wanted to show me something he said he learned about from one of his college professors. We already kind of lived in the middle of nowhere, but we drove even further into literally nowhere. We were on this road that was five to eight miles of just forest on both sides. No houses, no signs, no driveways, nothing. Then he pulls over near a slight break in the trees. It was a very overgrown old driveway, chained off at the road with an old dilapidated sign that said, private property. We parked on the road and walked in about half a mile. There was this old, abandoned, log cabin house there. I don't know when it was built, but it was old enough to not have any connection to the electric grid, and there were no electrical outlets inside. It was a bit odd, but my boyfriend said he'd been there before and led me to a door in the back where we could break in. He mentioned that the last property owner said in their will that no changes could be made to the property after they died, like no agriculture or major renovations, so I guess that's why the land was never resold since nobody could do anything with it. I don't remember if we entered through the second floor somehow or climbed up the stairs once inside, but I remember being on this loft that overlooked the interior of the house, with no railing. Definitely a 15 plus foot drop right at the edge of the loft. Maybe there weren't stairs inside at all, or a ladder. It was back in the fall of 2011 when I was a freshman in college, so it's a bit fuzzy. I remember seeing an old wood stove made of iron downstairs, and a countertop. But otherwise, I think the place was pretty sparse, and made entirely of wood. There was no sink in the kitchen, no bathrooms, and no plumbing either. The loft we were on had literally thousands of dead flies all over the floor. It was creepy and gross. I know they could have gotten stuck there over the years, but the sheer number of them on every surface and not being decayed or turned to dust was just so unnerving. My boyfriend, for some reason, decides this is a nice place to smoke weed. I didn't want to stay, but he laid a blanket over the flies. He sat and rolled a joint. 
I did take a couple of puffs, but I started to get an uneasy feeling, so I stopped. I'm a regular smoker, but this was just a crazy situation. Then suddenly, I realized that the sun was setting. We were losing light fast. The house very quickly got this terrifying impending doom feeling. I knew I needed to get the hell out of that house. I expressed my concerns to my boyfriend multiple times, each time seeming more desperate to leave. But he wasn't worried and took his sweet ass time hand rolling himself a cigarette, taking all the unnecessary shit out of his pockets, laying them out on the blanket, and slowly putting them away. It was pissing me off that he wasn't taking me seriously. I had such a sense of urgency to get out. I ended up getting out of that house first and started hauling ass down that half mile long dirt driveway to get out in the way. My boyfriend shuffled behind me, fumbling with things in his hands. I got out of the woods when we were just losing that last light before the true darkness set in. Mind you, this country road has no street lights the whole way. He had flashlights, but I didn't feel that flashlights equaled safety. I felt we were being watched, and whatever it was, was really negative. I don't know if I overreacted or my boyfriend was literally just doped up and clueless, but I never really trusted him after that. I don't know why the hell I let myself get in that situation. Needless to say, he's not in my life anymore. This happened to me years ago. It was around 2 in the morning during the summer, and I was asleep. My blinds were cracked, but my room was on the second floor of the house. I woke up to the sound of my phone vibrating against my pillow. The moon was shining through the blinds, dimly lighting up half my room and leaving the other half in the dark. My phone read, no caller ID. I don't remember why, but I felt like I needed to answer it. Groggily, I mumbled, Hello? The man's voice I did not recognize replied after a solid and quite few seconds. Are you alone? I couldn't think of what to say. I didn't say or do anything for what felt like minutes. I couldn't put a face or name to the voice. It was low and grumbly, and he sounded like he was moving. Finally, I said, No, and hung up. Seconds later, I heard the doggy dog downstairs open. You all know the sound, but imagine that slowed down. My dog was in my bed, now moving towards me as I'd woken him up. The doggy door closed. I sat in the unsettling silence, waiting for the sound of footsteps to come up the stairs. Nothing. After a few minutes, I slowly got out of bed and made my way to the window, which overlooked the backyard. From there, I could see the back gate on the side of the house, slightly ajar. I stood and stared, unsure about what to do. I quietly went down the stairs, ready to face whatever or whoever entered my house, but the back door was shut and locked. In order to get through the doggy door, the back door had to be open. This gave me some relief, but I was still unsettled that someone had tried to enter my house. So, to the man who tried to break in, and somehow found my old number, shut the damn gate on your way out. This story happened about five years ago in a fairly small town in Illinois. I was 26 years old at the time. My husband and I were looking to rent a small house. We needed a bigger place than our one bedroom, one that would accommodate us and two of his cousins. They would be staying with us for an extended vacation from another country. I went to look at a set of attached houses and was joined on my tour by another older woman. She asked me what I did for work and I told her I work with children with special needs. She said that she had a son with a disability and if we both moved in, I could help him. I didn't think much of it at the time. Flash forward a couple of weeks, and we're in the move-in process. 
The houses occur in groups of four, with two groups on the left side of the street and two on the right. The road is basically a dead end. We move into the second house of the quad on the right side, and the lady I toured with moves into the second on the left side, exactly across from us. On either side of our house is a family with children, grandparents raising a 13-year-old granddaughter, and a Brady Bunch stepfamily raising multiple children with at least two to three teen girls. This matters later, I promise. Everyone seemed friendly and family-oriented. A few weeks after we moved in, we're waiting for his cousins to arrive. I see the lady I toured with occasionally, but I never see a small child with a disability. She does have what appears to be an adult son living with her, mid-twenties, average height, slightly bulky, he often sits on the patio furniture in his garage with the door up. When I'm coming home or leaving, we wave and say hi. But that's about it. A lot of people in the neighborhood use their garages as patios. It's very weird. I can't explain it. One night, it's about 3am. I'm in graduate school and stay up all hours of the night studying. My husband works midnights in a Toyota factory and wouldn't be home for about 4 hours. I had just laid down about 20 minutes before, but was not asleep yet. It was going to suck at 6.30am, but 4 hours a night was the norm then. All of a sudden, I hear a loud knock at the door. I go to answer it. There's no people, but about 2 feet away, there's an oversized set of windows that looks into the living room. They're covered with blinds, and peeking out is clearly noticed by the person at the door. I skip this and talk through the door. I will stop here and say I'm inherently naive. I trust everyone, but I'm getting somewhat better since we've moved to a city since this occurred. At the other side of the door is the neighbor's adult son. He tells me that his mother left for work. He forgot his keys. Could I let him borrow my phone to call his mother? I go to unlock the door, justifying that I know this man from the neighborhood. I wanted to help. At the very last second, my brain kicks in. I tell him I'll dial the number for him, and I go get my phone. When I return, I see the handle jiggling. Why didn't I stop then, I don't know. Instead, I ask him for the number. I still don't know why I didn't open the door. I'm very naive, but also very thankful that something stopped me. He rattles off a bunch of numbers. The area code wasn't right. It wasn't enough for a telephone number. I ask him to repeat it, thinking maybe I misheard. He says, Oh, that's okay. My mom just pulled up. Remember, his house is parallel to mine. I look out the window and no one has arrived. The garage door isn't up. No car is in the driveway. No lights are on. He walks over and walks directly into the home from the front door. After taking a few deep breaths, I try to decide if I should call 911 or if maybe I'm being paranoid. Somehow, maybe I did miss his mom's arrival. However, at that moment, a police car pulled up, lights on. The couple on the left side of this man's house, who, coincidentally, work with my husband, they come out to meet the police. I also go out thinking I can at least ask the officer to follow up once whatever he was called out for was resolved. Turns out, the man had tried to open their door and walk in. They also worked midnights but had the day off. They also kept up the late hours. They were watching TV, heard him, and called the cops. I tell the police my story and go back to bed. I figure I'm overreacting because he didn't ask me to make a statement or otherwise record my issue. Moreover, I'll check this all out, little lady's thing. The next day I'm talking to the grandmother of the 13-year-old, and also the mother with multiple kids that lived on either side of me. Apparently, he watched their daughters playing outside, and even asked them to come over and sit on his lap in the garage. The grandmother said he tried to open the bedroom window of the girl, but it was locked. I don't know if they reported this to the police, but they said he was asked to move by the landlord. His mother could stay, but he wasn't allowed to live there or visit. After that, things calmed down. We did notice tool marks on the back door. I know for a fact the marks weren't there when we moved in. 
as I took a picture of everything to ensure we were returned our deposit. However, I didn't observe them until a few weeks later. He was already gone. I can't say for sure he did do it, or if someone else did later. Either isn't a comforting choice. Many months later, near the end of our one-year lease, I start to see the sun around again. He wasn't consistently at home like before, but appears to visit once a week or so. One night, around 2.30 a.m., there's a loud knock on the door. This time, my husband, who had switched to a daytime shift by that time, answers through the door. As soon as the person hears a male voice, they turn and walk away. They were wearing a hoodie and dark clothes, and my husband couldn't see his face. The body type is similar. The person walks at an angle away from our house, in the general direction of the back of the neighbor's house. It was unclear if he was walking towards the creek area with an open field behind, or to the back of the row of houses across from us. Either way, I called the landlord the next day. He confirmed the man wasn't supposed to live there. He said he had mental challenges, but he didn't elaborate. He said he would follow up. We never saw him again and luckily moved across the country a few weeks later. This story happened when I was about 17 years old, and my friend at the time was 16. We were both female. One night, we were at my parents' house, which is basically small town USA, we decided to go for a walk around my neighborhood. It wasn't too late, but it was starting to get dark. It was maybe around 9 or 9.30 p.m. There were a few houses being built in my neighborhood at the time, so we decided to go explore the inside of one. We entered the house through the garage area because there wasn't a door, and the house was basically a frame with a few walls. I stayed near the entrance because I was getting a really bad vibe but my friend decided to go further into the house. About two or three minutes into our exploration, I heard loud moaning sounds coming from the half-built stairs. I asked my friend if she heard it, and she said, no, and kept on looking at stuff. That was when I saw a very large man stand up on the stairs and start to walk down them. I grabbed her and screamed, run. We bolted out of there. I refused to look back the entire time because I was too scared to see if he was running after us. Once we got to my house, we ran inside and locked the doors. Nothing else happened that night. The next weekend, the same friend was over at my house again. We were sitting outside on my trampoline at about 1am. We were talking about random shit when she just stopped mid-sentence and went pale as a ghost. When I asked her what was wrong, all she said was, we need to go inside, right now. While we got off the trampoline, she never took her eyes off the spot of my yard she was looking at. Once inside, I asked her what the hell that was about. She said someone was in my backyard, sitting by my mom's flower bed. The person was on the ground, rocking back and forth, while apparently staring at us. My mom and stepdad were already asleep, so we didn't want to bother them. Instead, we made sure all of the doors and windows were locked, and that there was a weapon by the door if it came to that. After we calmed down, we went down to the basement to my room. We started watching some movies. The street lamp was shining through the little window in my room, and I shit you not, there was someone walking back and forth in front of my window. At this point, we were so scared we decided to wake my stepdad up. He went outside and didn't find anyone. Nothing happened again for a few weeks, until one day I was home alone by myself and kept getting weird phone calls. It was a guy with a really deep voice, asking how I was doing and what I was doing, if my mom and stepdad were home. I hung up on him every time without answering. About 20 minutes after the last phone call, I heard a loud crashing sound in my basement that scared the fuck out of me. That was about all I could take. I pushed our couch against the basement door, grabbed a butcher knife, and noped the fuck out of there to my neighbor's house. Luckily, her dad was home and called the police. 
When the police got there, I told them everything that had been happening. They checked out my basement. Someone had popped out the window in my bedroom and it shattered all over my bed. There was no one in my basement and nothing has happened ever since. From the time I was 12 up until I was 18, my mom lived in a two-story apartment. I lived with and was raised by my maternal grandparents, but I spent a great deal of time staying with my mother, so both places were equally home for me. For the entire six years that she lived there, my mother received sporadic phone calls from an unknown caller that we both came to call the Hello Man. The reason for this is fairly simple. When he called, he would say hello several times in a monotonous voice, with a short, evenly timed pause between each utterance. The only time he has ever called was when no one happened to be there, so each call was recorded on the messaging machine. Each time the call was made from a blocked number or a public place, and it goes without saying that it wasn't a voice we recognized. The first few times we wrote it off as being a wrong number or a prank, it wasn't exactly threatening in any way, and it wasn't even unsettling to us either. For the entire six years, we would receive these calls. Sometimes weeks or months would pass by before we'd find another one of these messages on the answering machine. After a few years, when we became completely certain that it wasn't someone we knew, we still didn't find any harm in them. Irritating to come home on a bad day when you're already in a bad mood, but nothing more. It even became a bit of a running joke in the family, weaving into the idle comments that made up our days and small talk between one another. In all these years we received the calls, the messages were always the same and no other contact was made between this person and us. About two years before she eventually moved out, my mother had a number changed. Several weeks after doing so, a new message from the hello man was left. The context of the call was the same. Hello? 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 But for the first time, the tone and pacing was different. There was barely a pause between each word, and he was louder, almost panicky in the way he spoke. Later that week, a second message was left. This one sounded angry, and he just said hello a single time. For the first time, we felt a bit threatened by the caller. How had he gotten her new number? You'd think this would be more reason for us to suspect a friend or family member, but it only made us more sure that it wasn't. No one we knew would take a prank far enough to make us feel like it was a legitimate threat, no matter how small. The small sense of fear dispersed quickly, however. It was weeks before we received another call, and when we did, it was back to the same monotone and slow repetition as before. In fact, after this point, the calls came even more infrequently than before. We all but forgot about the hello man in the times between. At the end of those six years, I was staying with my mom nearly full time to help her pack up and organize. Due to some various personal issues, she would be putting most of her belongings in storage and stay with us for a short time before finding a new place for herself. On one particular night, when it was just me and my mother spending the night at a now nearly barren apartment, we received the last call from the hello man, an actual call while we were there, not a message left for us to find hours, even just minutes later. At the time, we'd been taking a break and watching a movie, which was just the reason we still kept the couch, TV, and DVD player at the apartment. Hello. Hello. I know you're there this time. Hello. There was a long pause during which we heard nothing, not even the sound of his breath. Then, just as the answering machine was about to cut off his message, he started quoting a line from a movie that had just been said a few minutes before. The machine beeped and cut him off, but he didn't call back. Needless to say, we called my grandfather to come pick us up because we didn't want to spend the night there any longer.
So I currently attend college in a major city in the United States. It's a lovely place with tons of fun things to do. However, it has one big downside. It's a major human trafficking hub. For me, a teenage girl, this means that I have to be especially careful. My parents gave me the whole safety talk before I moved out. Never go out into the city alone, especially at night. For my first eight months on campus, nothing too concerning happened, save for a few catcallers and the particularly inappropriate behavior of one homeless man as I ran past him during a workout. However, when I returned to campus after spring break, I had one of the most anxiety-inducing experiences of my life. I visited my parents over spring break and taken a bus back. It was a lot cheaper than airfare, and my cat didn't handle well with flying. I'd visited home a few times and usually I had no problems getting from the bus station to my door when I got back to the city. I'd call a ride from a nap and be home in 10 minutes or so. My bus got in around 9ish at night, so it was already dark outside. I'm not sure what happened, but for some reason, the GPS on the ride sharing app must have messed up my location. Four different drivers missed the turn to find me and ended up cancelling the ride. After 30 minutes of waiting, now on the fifth driver, I finally called the teller exactly where I was outside the station, so there wouldn't be any confusion. She said she was on her way, so I stood on the curb and waited. I had headphones on, but wasn't playing any music. This was my way of preventing people from approaching me, but also allowing me to hear and be aware of my surroundings. Boy, I'm glad I did that. After about two minutes of standing on the curb, a man walks directly behind me, stops, and leans up against a wall. At first, I'm only mildly wary of the man. I feel the vague sensation that he's watching me, but I try not to get too paranoid. After feeling like the staring is continuing, I text my boyfriend to let him know what's going on, just in case. The man pulls out a flip phone and makes a call. I feel a bit less nervous, until I hear the conversation. I'm not sure who he was talking to on the call, but the man was describing details of my appearance into the phone. I heard snippets like, She's tall, maybe 5 foot 8, red hair, yeah, yeah, she's young, she's pretty. I try not to show any sign that I'm hearing all of this. My headphones are still on, so I figure he thinks I'm clueless. I check my phone to see where my ride is. She's stuck at an intersection about a half mile away. I'm not sure what I should do at this point. I couldn't just start running because I had my bag and a cat carrier. I decide to call my driver again and ask her if I can stay on the line with her until she gets here. I can tell she's a little confused, but I didn't want to go into detail. If this guy was trouble, I wanted to make sure he didn't do anything suddenly. If he realized I caught on to him. However, I didn't want to call the police because I didn't think I had enough to report him yet. I also didn't want to walk anywhere else, because the surrounding area wasn't as well lit as where I was standing already. For some of you, this may not sound like the scariest experience. For me, however, being alone at night in a big city with a human trafficking problem, and suddenly having a strange man stare at me and call to tell someone what I looked like in creepy detail, it scared me, big time. He hung up his phone after a few minutes. And thank God my ride got there a minute later. I'm not sure I want to know what would have happened if that driver had cancelled on me too. When I was four months old in 1994, my mom and dad had been having money issues and as a result, he would often work late. One late Wednesday night at around 9pm, there was a knock at my door. My mom put me down in the living room and went to see if it was dad, having forgotten his keys. She opened the door without looking properly, and the man was standing on the doorstep. He smiled at her and asked if he could use our phone as his car had broken down. Flustered, she said yes. She walked backwards a bit to let him get to the phone that was on the hall table. However, he didn't stop at the table. He kept walking up the hall towards her. She asked him what he wanted, 
pointing at the phone saying it was right there. Then said her husband was about to get out of the shower. This is where it starts to get really creepy. He stopped walking, cocked his head to one side, said he didn't hear the shower running, and then he gave her a really big smile. He said, it's just you at home now, isn't it? My mom said at this point, all she could think about was trying to make it to me. Maybe dropping me out of a window, trying to get us into a bathroom that had a lock. Praying to any god or gods that were listening that dad would pull up in the driveway. Anything. And then she heard a growl. My mom had been out, getting the washing in from the outside laundry, before she gone in to check on me in the living room. She left the back door open a crack. Our Doberman Pride had gotten into the house and walked out of the kitchen into the hallway. Between mom and this man, she started growling, showing all of her teeth. My mom told the man to get out now, before she set the dog on him. Apparently he freaked out and backed out of the house before taking off down the street. My dad got home about 20 minutes later. It felt like an eternity according to mom. The man was never caught, and we never saw him again. I really hope I never do, even though I wouldn't know if I saw him. Pride lived there until she was 13. She was the most spoiled dog ever. I don't know what would have happened to my mom or me without her. I tried facetiming my best friend and someone answered, but it wasn't my friend. I hadn't realized it wasn't her, so I stayed on the call. The camera was on and facing up to the wall and ceiling. The person on the other end didn't say anything, so I began talking. That's when I noticed a purple wall. I've never seen a purple wall in her house. Suddenly the camera flipped and they hung up. I was so freaked out because it isn't something my friend would do since she doesn't answer calls unless she can stay and talk on them. Confused, I texted her, asking if I called her since I thought I could have called the wrong number. She said that she didn't answer any call. Then I sent her a screenshot of my recently called. When she checked, it did show an answered FaceTime from me at the same time. Moments later, I called her, but through the message app, and she answered. I asked if she had painted her walls purple, but she had no idea what I was talking about. That's when I explained everything to her, and we started to freak out. Once we checked the call information from her phone, it said that the FaceTime was answered from another device. She checked her Apple ID information and saw another device was logged in that she didn't know. Quickly, she changed her password, and seconds later, she got a notification that someone in a different state was trying to log into her account. It's still creepy to think that this person had access to everything on her iCloud for God knows how long. When I was about 11 years old, I lived in undisclosed military housing because my stepdad served. I had an Android phone and I had not done my homework or something like that. In result, my mother took my phone away and had it taken apart. She set it on a nightstand, and that was that. A few days had gone by where I didn't have it. I got bored and went to bother my brother, whose room was right across the hall. We started talking about random stuff as kids usually do. We got onto the topic of the president at the time, which was Obama. We were just saying stuff we thought we knew about and blah blah blah. But here's where it takes a turn. Another few days go by, and my mom gave me my phone back. I saw I had a voicemail left from an unknown caller. It was my entire ten minute conversation with my brother. The only person who had a phone in the house was my mother, and her room was not near us. The conversation was most definitely us down to our each laugh and cough. It was our conversation. It was not foggy like a normal call, but clear as a movie where there would be mics attached to our shirts. It really freaked us out. We have no explanation because it was not a technology glitch. 
Like I said, no phones were near us. A couple of years ago, I got a phone call in the middle of the night. It was around 2 a.m. I didn't check who it was. I was half asleep and said, Hello? When a deep voice said, I hope you're ready. I'm going to kill you. I was so unbothered, I responded, Well, I'll see you soon. I hung up and went back to sleep immediately. The next day, I was at school when I remembered what happened. I thought it was just a crazy dream, but who would just call someone and say that? I looked through my phone and saw that I did have a call at 2 something in the morning from an unknown number. I never figured out who called me, and nor did they call back. When I was around 20 years old, I was working at a beauty supply, located in a large plaza with a bunch of other businesses. I ended up walking by a cab, saw a hiring sign, and applied. I got the job. I kept the beauty supply job, and since these two businesses were in the same plaza, I created a schedule where I would work both jobs in one day, with an hour break in between shifts. Sometimes I was so tired because of the commute and two jobs that I would take that time to nap. I started moving my car next to a small parking area beside a Burger King. There were only three spaces and one was occupied by a van. So I would park on the far left, leaving one spot separating my car from the van. I did this almost every day for a couple of weeks. The van stayed in the same place the entire time. At this point, I basically lived at the plaza. I never saw anyone going in or out of that van. I arrived at the cafe one day to see caution tape around my napping spot, where the van was located. I asked my co-worker what happened, and they said police were called since the van seemed to be abandoned, and that they discovered a corpse in the van. I can't remember how long they said the person had been dead for, but I was napping next to a van with a corpse. I changed my shifts to start back to back, no more napping in between. This happened to me about 15 to 16 years ago when I was displaced in Las Vegas after Hurricane Katrina occurred. I was 9 years old at the time and I lived in this cul-de-sac of townhomes. Without sharing all the details, this was the first time I ever had a friend who lived in my neighborhood, so he and I would often hang out from early mornings to about 11pm or so. One night while we were hanging out, there was this ice cream truck that was passing around. It hadn't turned on the typical music you hear when a truck's approaching, but when I got near it began to light up and play the music. My friend and I, who was about the same age, approached the truck to see what it had to offer. I decided I didn't want any ice cream, likely because I didn't have any money to buy any, but my friend wanted some. He explained what he wanted to the guy. When the guy suggested he get in the truck and pick out which flavor he wanted, and he would give him an ice cream for free. For some strange reason, my friend was actually going to get in the truck when I yanked his arm and screamed something. Immediately after, we ran to our parents and explained to them what happened. After this, we'd have to be inside by the time the sun set. I can't say for sure what would have occurred, but I'm thankful neither of us got into that truck. This happened a few years back when I worked at Starbucks. I was the opening supervisor and our store was in a kind of rough area. I always tried to arrive a little early, and this day was no different. I pulled in before my co-worker had gotten there, but in the otherwise empty parking lot was a truck parked sideways across three spots. The truck is facing the parking lot exit. Already wary, as it's around 4.15am, 
and there were no working streetlights in the lot. I keep my doors locked and stay in my car. Not a minute later, a man gets out of the truck and walks up to my car, then knocks on my window. I crack the window an inch, and he starts telling me how he has to get to the airport and he's in a hurry, but his truck needs a push to start. He tells me specifically that I just need you to come push for my door. I'll be in the driver's seat, and that'll give me the momentum I need. I don't know shit about cars, but that set off all the alarm bells in my head. Not to mention, if his car's having trouble, our airport was really far and only accessible by freeways. Not an easy trip for a struggling vehicle. I tell him I'll be happy to push the truck from behind once my co-worker arrives, but I refuse to get out before. He immediately blows up. He screams and calls me all sorts of names, then storms back to his truck. He starts the truck up and speeds out of the parking lot. Never had anything come of it, but I'm still pretty sure I foiled some malicious plans of that guy. I'm grateful I'm enough of a morning person to be thinking clearly that early. This happened when I was around 17 years old, and is still happening now. At 17, I felt lost in the world and stuck in a job I disliked, with work colleagues that didn't like me. This had to do with my accent, as I was quite well spoken, so they thought I was a rich kid. It all started on a Friday after work. The factory I worked in had a half day on Fridays, so I would just spend the rest of the day wandering around the city I lived in. It had been a tough day of relentless mocking. I was reaching my breaking point. I went around the city looking for a new job. I visited the police recruitment center, the army, navy, and air force centers, and even the international Red Cross. I just wanted to get away from it all. After a few hours, I had a bag full of career pamphlets and still no idea what to do with my life. I turned a corner and immediately saw a sign sitting in front of me. I can remember it so vividly now. It said, Free personality test. Are you curious about yourself? Come in. I then looked up at the building, and in a big fancy sign outside, it said, The Church of Scientology. Now before I continue, yes, I already knew about Scientology. However, I had a morbid curiosity about it. I had heard all the horror stories and goings-on inside the church, but Tom Cruise was my favorite actor, and he seemed to have his life sorted out pretty good. My famous last words right there. So I went inside. I was immediately greeted by a very nice lady. She asked me how I was doing and what she could do for me today. I asked if I could speak to somebody about the church and the personality test. She smiled and said, I would be happy. Please take a seat and I will get you someone to speak to. After a minute, I was introduced to an older man named Alan. He was the head of my city Scientology Center. Alan took me to a small room to talk privately. When we entered, I immediately noticed the large picture of L. Ron Hubbard on the wall. We sat down and genially had a nice talk. I told him about how I was unhappy about where my life was going. I told him about how I wanted to leave, plus all the trouble I was having at work. He seemed genuinely concerned for me, and I felt like he wanted to help. After a while of talking, I agreed to do the personality test. He gave me the test and left the room, saying to give the test to the receptionist after I had finished. Two hours later, I finished it. I'm not joking. That's really how long it took. It was around 500 questions about anything and everything. I handed it in to the receptionist. She told me it would take some time to process. In the meantime, Alan had told her to take me to their private cinema and show me a film. I thought it was just going to be some old room in the back with a TV on the wall. But no, they did indeed have a private cinema. It could sit around 50 people and had a large screen in the front. It did feel a bit weird, just being by myself in a cinema owned by Scientology, but I bet that hasn't happened to many people. Or maybe it has. Anyway, I sat down 
and they played me a film. It was about 30 minutes long and consisted of a narrator explaining those strange feelings you sometimes get, with some mediocre acting following along. I remember a section about how much you doubt yourself, knowing you have a locked door, but going back to check multiple times. At one point, the film showed how a past event that happened to your mother while she was pregnant with you could affect your life in a negative way. I also vaguely remember something about rotten eggs and how much an event involving them can hurt you. I know it sounds absurd, but in some ways, the film really made sense to me. When the film was done, I was taken to Alan's office and he told me my results. He told me I was extremely depressed, one of the most unmotivated people he had even met, lacking cognitive thinking, and I was a waste of talent. Now this made me very upset. But Alan said he could help me. He gave me about four books and a DVD. He told me to read the books and watch the film before my course. I asked, what course? And Alan told me he had signed me up to do a course at the center. He convinced me that if I didn't do this course, that my life would soon spiral out of control. He made me hand over quite a lot of money for this course, and then said I would receive an email about the course, which was in a month's time. I left the center, ran home, and immediately started reading the books I was given. This all happened over the weekend. I basically locked myself in my room and did nothing but read and reread those books. I watched the DVD over and over again. Over the next week, I began taking notes about myself and my family. I emailed Alan with questions and concerns. I started resenting my own mother for my life. I began to think that she was the problem, that everything bad that happened to me was the result of her. I started to treat her badly, swearing at her and did the best I could to ignore her. When I emailed Alan about my mother, he told me that if she was the catalyst for my problems, then maybe I should consider disconnecting from her. And I took that bullshit seriously. I made plans to totally leave her out of my life. A week before my course, I developed some kind of god complex towards everyone around me. What I read in those books told me what I could become. I saw everyone in my family as below me. I really became a truly spiteful person. Just days before my course, I was confronted by my mother and father. They said they were concerned about me and that they searched my room. My dad took out all of my Scientology books and the DVD. I was outraged. I screamed and cursed at my parents. I said horrible, wicked things to them. I told them how I was going to leave them and how I never wanted to see them again. Hours of arguing back and forth, tears and crying. However, in the end, they did convince me that the church was a bad place. They said if I was so miserable at work, I should have told them. And that is true. To this day, I can't believe I didn't say anything to them. Instead, I went to Scientology. That night, after the arguing had stopped, they sat me down and confronted me. I really couldn't believe it. After the way I had treated them for the past three weeks, they still cared for me. The next day I emailed Alan and told him I would not be coming back to the church. He quickly got back to me, asking me why asking if it was my family and if I was being forced not to go. However, I ignored him. The emails I received in the next few weeks were mad. He told me stuff like, I should leave my family now and I could stay at the church. He tried to convince me that it was all because of my mother. He even emailed me to say something along the lines of, he wouldn't be surprised if he read in the newspaper that I was found dead because I killed myself. I am very sure he crossed the line there, but I just kept ignoring him. The strangest emails I got was one all in binary code, 00110101 this and that. I used a binary code translator, but it all came back as mixed up letters and numbers. None of it made sense. I eventually blocked it, however it hasn't stopped. About two or three times a year, I will get an email from the church. It's either asking how I am or asking about my family. When I get them, 
I immediately block the email address, but they just keep coming. It's always someone new, saying they heard about my case and that they were worried for me. The whole reason I'm telling this is because I just got one the other day. I thought it would make a good warning. Please, I beg of you, do not go to a Church of Scientology center. If they can make me into a spiteful degenerate in just a few hours, then what can they do with a person in a few months or a year? If you're lost in life, sad or upset, then please talk to your family, friends, or a doctor. When you're down, don't let others make you into a monster. Take it from me. After this event, I got help, and I'm a happy and confident person now. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, and Alan, if you're listening to this, you made me into a monster. So, I'm currently going through a nasty divorce. I left my wife about four months ago and moved into a house by myself close to work. We have a four and a half year old daughter which I haven't been able to see for the last four months because my wife filed an injunction against me. Luckily, she recently came to her senses and dropped the injunction and now I have 50-50 timeshare with my daughter which starts next weekend. Well, this past weekend, my mom came to town to help me set up the new house because you know, I'm a guy, and guys have no sense of decor, right? At least, that's how my mom thinks. And when it comes to me, she's right. We bought a twin bed for my daughter's room, bought her frozen-themed furniture and decor. We got a bunch of knickknacks to decorate the whole house. Candles, pictures, fake plants, rugs, and that kind of thing. We did everything we could to make it more homey. Before we bought all these new rugs and set up my daughter's room, I kept my cat's litter box in my daughter's room for the past four months while it was empty. After setting up her room, I moved the litter box to another empty bedroom. Well, my cat didn't like the fact her box moved. Apparently she had decided that that room was going to be her room and absolutely refused to use the litter box after it moved. Instead, she would go to the bathroom on the carpets any time my mom and I were out of the house. The entire weekend, the two of us cleaning the new rugs with strong cleaning products. Every time she would use the bathroom on one. Finally, I decided to put the litter box back in my daughter's room until I could figure out a solution. Trust me, this is relevant. Fast forward to Monday late afternoon. My mom's flight is at 6 p.m. So we leave the house, go out for one last meal, and I drop her off at the airport. I get home around 6.30pm to my newly furnished and decorated house. It definitely made me feel more at home. I had no plans that night, so I spent most of the night on the couch binge watching movies and drinking scotch. Around 11.30 I was pretty hammered and I stumbled to my bedroom, closed the door, locked it, and collapsed on my bed. I passed out instantly. Around 4.30 a.m., I woke up to the worst smell I think has ever hit my nose. It was so bad, it actually pulled me out of my drunken sleep. My first thought was the cat took a shit on the rug again. I ignored it, rolled over, and tried to go back to sleep. But I couldn't. The smell was that bad. Finally, I got up unlocked the bedroom door and peeked out into the living room to see if she had left a surprise on the rug. Clean. I looked in my daughter's room and my cat had indeed started using her litter box again, so the smell wasn't because of my cat. I shrugged it off, closed and locked my door, and again collapsed on my bed. I laid on my bed staring into the darkness for about 30 minutes trying to fathom what I was smelling. Maybe it was the combination of my cat's shit and all the cleaning products we used over the weekend. Maybe a pipe burst somewhere. Did I forget to take the trash to the curb and I was smelling all the shit we threw away the weekend? No matter what conclusion I came up with, none of it made sense. A little after five, I get up and walk to the bathroom 
and I sit down on the toilet. I browse Reddit for a few minutes on my phone until I'm done. I flush the toilet, then collapsed on my bed again. You know that draining sound the toilet makes after you flush it? I'm laying there on my bed, listening to the toilet do its drain cycle, until it finally stopped and I was in complete silence. That's when I heard it. A sniff, and the sound of someone clearing their throat from my closet. I don't know what happened, but I immediately jumped into survival mode. I jumped out of bed, grabbed my phone, unlocked my bedroom door, grabbed my car keys and bolted out the front door and jumped in my car. I started the car and backed out of my driveway and into my neighbor's driveway across the street. I shined my high beams at the house while I called the police. They were there within minutes. The cops approached my car and I tell them there was someone in my closet. I sleep naked, so the cops thought I was just some random drunk at first sight. But after two minutes of arguing, they went in to investigate. They were in there for what seemed like hours. And sure enough, they came out with a very skinny, obviously homeless man in handcuffs. They put the guy in the back of one of their cruisers and approached my car to ask me questions. Apparently this guy snuck in through the back sliding glass door while I was dropping off my mom at the airport. He admitted to looking for pills or something to pawn for pills when he heard me come home. He freaked out and jumped into my closet. The smell I was smelling was his terrible B.O. coming from my closet three feet away from me. This man was in my house the entire night. What if I didn't smell him and opened my closet the next morning? while getting ready. What if I had my daughter over that night? The whole thought gives me shivers. I've been working from home for about two years. Three weeks ago, I was asked to come into the office, and yesterday was my first day back working at home. We have one of those doorbell cameras, but it broke down. Since I'm home all the time, we haven't gotten around to fixing it or replacing it. We haven't taken it down either. I don't have a gate or anything in my house. It's just the driveway, then the door. I have a clear view of my driveway and front door from my bedroom window. At around 1pm, there was a knock at the door. I looked out of my window and saw a man. He was wearing a dark brown hoodie and jeans. He didn't look like he was expecting someone to open the door. He also pressed the non-working doorbell a couple of times. It seemed like he was paying more attention to the street, looking around kind of nervously. When someone knocks at my door and I don't know them, I will not answer the door. I just stay quiet until they leave. But this time, I got a weird feeling. It was like I had a heavy rock in my stomach, alarms going off in my head. I yelled, coming. He suddenly stood straight up and looked around some more, waited a few seconds, then walked away in a hurry. I looked at him until he disappeared out of my view. This was one of the moments that your instinct kicks in, and deep down, you know something bad may have happened, and cannot stop thinking about it. This morning, my nosy neighbor came by to tell me the week's gossip. It's my day off, so I was sweeping my driveway. Someone had broken into one house yesterday. Nothing was stolen, but the shower had been used. The kitchen was messy from someone cooking. The bed was unmade, and all the TVs were on. The horror was, the family pet had been killed. I don't live in a nice neighborhood. A lot of my neighbors have cameras and alarm systems for this reason. I couldn't stop thinking about this guy knocking. According to some neighbors, they saw this weird guy around the block, supposedly selling some cleaning products and supplies, but he only carried a clipboard around. I went to the neighbors that lives across the street from me. I know they have security cameras. I was hoping maybe they caught something. So for three days, this guy had knocked on my door at the same time every day. I guess his M.O. was to make sure no one was home all week and then break in. What would have happened if I had stayed quiet like I normally do when someone unknown knocks at my door? He would have probably come in with me in the house. It creeps me out. 
When I was walking back into my house, my doorbell caught my attention. It was full of some gunky stuff, kind of like someone attempted to cover the camera. I guess I should definitely replace that. There's talks of some neighbors having video evidence. Others say they actually saw this guy. It's all still going on. I'm sure I'll know more about it in the next few days. I'm feeling really anxious. I've been thinking about going on a trip to visit my family, just to get away for a bit. I don't live in the US, so the way the police handle matters here is different. The family pet was a large dog. Neighbors say he started barking loudly at some point during the day, and then suddenly stopped. So that may be the reason why he was killed. I had just returned from a walk around the neighborhood when my fiancé and I saw the most peculiar and creepiest thing. There is a neighborhood cat that will sometimes follow us on walks, and tonight she came out to walk with us. We were turning back to head home when a man up the street came walking down with his German Shepherd in our direction. The cat froze on someone's driveway, giving clear signs that she was not okay with the man and his dog approaching her, but still. He walked towards her more. We hung around a house over, wondering what he was doing as he commanded his dog to sit in front of her, only a couple of feet away. They both just stared at her. The man was silent, the dog was growling, and she hissed. I had a very bad feeling and did not want to walk on until he left. But he continued to stand there with his dog, almost to intimidate the cat. My fiancé then told him to leave the cat alone and he didn't once turn to look at us. Instead, he kept staring at the cat. We waited a few more minutes and then repeated, Leave that cat alone. The man very slowly backed off, said nothing to us, crossed the street, and then walked back in the direction he came from. We both felt he was up to no good, especially since he never said a word to us, not even to mind your business or... I'm not hurting the cat. It's almost as if we weren't there or something, because he was not weirded out by us watching him. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you have a story you'd like me to feature on the channel, you can send it to my email, or if you have a Reddit, submit it on my subreddit. You'll find the details in the video description below. I'll pin a comment too. Do me a favor and leave a like and comment. Subscribe if you haven't. And hit the bell icon and turn on notifications so you can stay up to date with my latest videos. I want to give a shout out to my channel members and patrons for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Jennifer L. K. Something Edgy. Pretty Girl 215. Borderline Betty. Sarah C, Blazed Goddess, Christopher, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drakkard, Sue, Absinthe Alice, Rochelle, Astara Ray, Monique, Crafty Kell, Monica Levelace, Emma, Sean Gorman, Jennifer, Skittles MM, Gabrielle, Serafina Nightingale, Misanthropia, Fluby, Ryan, Brenda, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 05, Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Feel free to check me out on any of my other social media. Links will be below too. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you're all doing well. I'll see you all on the next one.